I'm Mike Bonham, the chair. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. Paul Caretz and Mr. Tom Labonge. Mr. Parks and Mr. Kikorian are expected to join us uh, shortly. Let's start off as we do customarily with a multimodal roll call. Since the last tea committee meeting a couple weeks ago, who has commuted by train? Ooh, we've done better than that. Who has commuted by bus? Who has commuted by bicycle? Who has commuted by foot as a pedestrian? No. 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 All right, this is, this is not one of the most complete streets crowds we've ever had. Uh, who went to Seek Levia last week? Who did the okay. whole thing, one end to the other? Man, this is like the Public Works Committee. Um, <laughs> next Seek Levia, mark your calendars now, is uh, Sunday, October 5th, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's the heart of Los Angeles. If you have not seen downtown L.A., see it at Seek Levia. See it on bike or see it on foot. It's a different way of seeing and loving Los Angeles. Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's hit the agenda. Let's get rolling. Mr. Clerk, or yes. Item number one on the regular agenda is an LADOT report relative to the establishment of a temporary preferential parking district number 183 near Interceptor Street and Airport Boulevard. Okay, uh, this is uh, my motion to do um, a temporary preferential parking district in my district. Uh, there's uh, no comment cards, so um, I move. Second. Second. And Second. then we will uh, move this forward. Thank you. Okay. Item number two is a CAO report relative to the proposed funding agreement with Metro for the payment of $206 million by the city to assist with the construction of various uh, transportation projects. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's hold uh, item two for just a minute until Mr. Krikorian gets here. Uh, and uh, item number three is a Krikorian motion. So uh, let's skip forward to um, uh, item we got a crowd here. Let's do item number five. Item number five is a uh, LADOT and Los Angeles Fire Department reports relative to the traffic and public safety challenges faced by the Beachwood Canyon Hollywood Land neighborhood. Uh, Mr. Labonge, would you like to start with public comment? Uh, no, I think I think we'd like to start with a report for the department first. I see the captain of the police from Hollywood is here. You want to join the Department of Transportation and. Uh, I just think uh, as you open your meeting there, uh, God bless all officers, Officer Lee who uh, passed and the officers who are now in hospitals uh, just want to reflect every moment in the safety efforts that you and other agencies, transportation department officers in the street, as well as our firefighters and police officers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Aaron. Yes. Greg, Greg Civelli with the uh, Park Enforcement Traffic Control DOT. Aram Sahakian with LADOT Special Traffic Operations Emergency Response. And Pete Sarconi, LAPD, Hollywood. Okay, uh, just uh, I can cover what uh, we are doing as far as uh, deployment of our traffic officers. As you know, this started on a, a fire hazard weekend where we worked with the fire department. Uh, there was concern over high winds. I know this problem has been going on for years, but more specifically, our current response was started at that time uh, where we've received the concerns about fire access, availability for emergency equipment to get in. Um, so we had uh, called a meeting of the uh, area and uh, determined that what we needed to do was to keep traffic flow moving, don't allow it to be in gridlock, and so we assigned, uh, for that one weekend, we assigned seven traffic officers to the neighborhood to try to make the traffic flow more smoothly, uh, take aggressive action on parking violations to keep the roadway clear for emergency equipment, and to assist uh, with uh, um, LAPD and keeping people from stopping in the middle of the road to take photographs of the Hollywood sign, etc. Uh, that deployment was successful in the sense that we didn't have any major issues, although reports back from the community are that although the traffic was moving, it was still very hectic because there was so much traffic and we concur the traffic did continue to go through. We did use uh, signs uh, electronic message signs provided by the district office, the council district's office, to try to limit uh, access to the area due to the fire hazard for that weekend. Subsequent to that, on Saturdays and Sundays, we are deploying either three uh, or 
uh, three officers on Saturday and two officers on Sunday, depending on the weather conditions. So the weather conditions are, are better, we deploy more because we anticipate more people will come. Uh, those officers, again, are mainly there just to facilitate the flow of traffic. They cannot cr control access to city streets. They cannot close the city streets. They can only make sure that people don't stop in the city street and move them along and try to keep the flow from creating gridlock. Thank you. And, um, uh, and the direction was, Mr. Chair, is to ask the department, look at this situation, look at it at every day of the week and the impact and the issue of access by police and fire. And by the way, Battalion 5, our local battalion, is still in the battalion. I didn't call them down here, but their wishes are like yours. They like to see clear access. We asked the department to come up with recommendations. In addition to that, Mr. Chairman, and you as a coastal representative and very uh, uh, aggressive on all people, uh, I want to uh, say that I did uh, ask them to look for a preferential parking district yes. here, which is against my philosophy because you live next to a public park. When you live next to a public park, you've got to expect the public. But in this particular case, because the age uh, it's particularly north of Ledgewood, the, uh, the era of when these streets were built, the width of them, that is impacted, and there's no turnaround, no through street, etc. So if Aaron can give your professional recommendations, and thanks for the good job you did and your team on Seek Levia, but on this particular issue here, what would you recommend to the committee to uh, achieve the community's wish to have accessibility in case of emergency? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council, uh, Member Labange and Commissioners, uh, in response to uh, Councilman Labange's uh, motion, uh, which was seconded by uh, Councilman Cedillo, all three departments, the Fire Department, Police Department, and DOT, went out to the field, made some observations. And what the observations confirmed was uh, the videos that we receive from uh, the community themselves, they send us videos and, and, and fo photographs showing hundreds of people on, on some instances on weekends walking in the middle of the streets, vehicles trying to maneuver between people walking into the streets trying to get to the trailhead. So right off the bat there was a safety issue that we concurrently, all, all uh, three departments, we also consulted with, with parks and recs. Uh, immediately for us it was, it was very simple. The solution was to post one side of the street because even if we had a fire on top of the mountain there was no way at the peak with all the vehicles almost in a gridlock situation would have been able to make it up to the top. So immediately the recommendation was to post one side of the street, uh, tow away, no stopping anytime, and realizing the impact to the residents which will lose their parking, the recommendation is to implement the preferential parking district immediately and right after that to implement the tow away, no stopping. This will ensure that the residents will have parking on the other side of the street or within walking distance from their residences. Uh, the street is uh, 29 to 33 feet wide, Beechwood, uh, no sidewalks. Uh, uh, for approximately six, seven hundred feet, uh, the sidewalks where they are, they're very narrow, three, four feet wide with obstacles right in the middle. People are forced to walk in the street. So this is very important as a safety measure. Uh, as long as the trailhead is open, as long as we have hundreds of people, if not thousands on, on, on holidays going up to the trailhead, it's very important to post one side of the street. And that's the recommendation at this time. In addition to that, another recommendation was to uh, block off access to the parking at the north end of Beechwood, which was used by hikers, by uh, people going to the stables. And by controlling access to only uh, pe uh, uh, people going to the stables to ride the horses, there's only 20 parking spaces. So what it was creating is a flow of traffic going all the way to the top, no parking, turning around, making U-turns, coming back down. Uh, and last, the preferential parking district, that's also a recommendation. That's also a recommendation in, uh, in our memo. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if you'd like to hear from the public, I know there's a very uh, a large number of people from the community. And yeah, I got a little bait and switch going on here. I took them first when there were four cards, and now there's 21. Well, you believe in public comment. You're a good public comment guy as well. But if I know because of the schedule of what you have, if you want to have one minute plus as opposed to two, because I think you'll find uh, yeah, well, that we have, we've got over 20 cards, so we'll do a minute each. 
Okay, but if they need a little more, I'll post you allow that. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You could vacate your seats there, uh, Captain and Aaron. Uh, Hope Anderson, Christine Mills O'Brien, Ryan Scott Warren, and Maureen Tabor. Uh, which one is Ms. Anderson? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Hope Anderson. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm a resident of eight and a half years at 2800 North Beechwood Drive, which is a block above Beechwood Village. And the road is still relatively wide at that point. And the area outside my house is very interesting because it's really the last place you can stop if you are a truck that is lost in Hollywoodland. And they all are. Or there are moving vans that offload their their stuff because they can't go any further up. Everybody utilizes that block for that reason. Now, I don't park in the street. I park in my garage, but I'm very concerned that these service trucks are not going to have any place to park, and there definitely isn't any room for the existing residence cars plus all of these people who visit the area. For example, to climb the stairs that are right by my house, that's become a not-so-secret way of exercising. And I would say on weekends, probably 50 to 100 people climb up those stairs every, every day. So I'm just concerned that even though this proposal is well-meaning, I don't see it as being feasible. I Thank think you. it's a bit of a problem. Thank you. Uh, Christine O'Brien, 2811 Westshire Drive, Hollywoodland. Your motion requested four city departments to generate a thorough and detailed assessment of the situation. Their report failed because it did not identify what caused the problems other than GPS. And these are some of the problems. The illegal and unsafe development of the parking lot, hiking trail, and vista areas. Promotion by the city, Chamber of Commerce, and any and all media imagery showing the sign. The most re uh, recent um, being the Jeep commercial, the city's own website, and any time a politician uses the sign as a backdrop for pre a press conference. The lack of recognition that Hollywoodland has never been an official entrance to the park. Ask the right questions and you'll get the right answers and the right solutions. And I have some additional backup data that I'd like to educate you with. Thank you. Maureen Tabor on Westshire, resident for 20 years, 19 years. Uh, I thank you for the kind efforts that have been going on to address the safety issue, which has always been our major issue. Uh, but I don't think that this issue is going to solve it because the overarching problem is GPS. I recently visited Northern California, and I noticed that the Bohemian Club <clears throat> is not on Google, nor is even the street to get to the, to the Bohemian Club. And I, uh, I know you all know that if you're anywhere in the world, including in the middle of Griffiths Park, and you ask Google how to get to the Hollywood sign, it sends you to our neighborhood. So I implore the city to use its power, which it has, to approach Google and say, for safety reasons, we don't, don't want the Hollywood sign as a destination. We want Hollywood Vista signs as the destination. Ryan Scott Warren, 2570 North Beachwood Drive. Um, I, I largely concur with my fellow speakers here. Thank you for giving us the forum to, to, to discuss this. Um, I, I, uh, my fear is that this proposal um, isn't just a step but, but, but a Band-Aid on, on, on a larger problem. And the problem is that there are more, there are more than just the sort of Vista access points to Griffith Park as uh, tourist attractions up there. Um, and simply closing off that park um, and regulating the parking on one side of the street is not addressing the problem. Uh, GPS leads you to that great lookout for the Hollywood sign. There's the additional uh, attraction of the Lake Hollywood Reservoir, which is a huge uh, athletic attraction, um, in addition to the stairs, which uh, for exercise purposes are, are very popular as well. It, it is the uh, sort of um, combination of these elements that, it, that have created the problem, and, and I'm afraid that this is just not enough to, to, to deal with all of that. 
Thank you. Uh, next four, four speakers are Fran Reichenbach, Laura Davis, George Abrahams, and T.J. Escott. Hi, I'm Laura Davis, and uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Transportation Committee, um, rather than use my minute to speak, I'd like you to look at photographs I've taken, and I think they'll do the talking for me. With apologies to my neighbors who aren't going to hear what I've written here and see what I've uh, photographed. Stand up and see how many of us are here. Oh, you're all, we're all here. Uh, we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> the last two. Thank you. Just testify. She continue talking, or the clock will go to someone else. Okay. Uh, yes, TJ, you can have it. Thank you. I have, Thank you. So I have two minutes, correct? Uh, no, clock starts at one minute. I gave him my extra twenty. Yeah, yeah I just you got it for you. Okay. For you. Uh, TJ Escott. Good afternoon, council people. Uh, the unilateral actions of Councilman LaBonge in the city to install an illegal trailhead and parking lot at the end of Beechwood Drive has had many unintended consequences that have continued to reverberate in our community. Many band-aids have been proposed and tried from parking enforcement officers trying to direct traffic to no avail to two gates being installed at the end of Beechwood Drive to stop cars from using the illegal parking lot. The unintended consequences of which will be cars driving up only to find that there is no parking, further exacerbating the traffic confusion. The latest proposal before us today is to eliminate parking on the east side of Beechwood Drive, further disrupting and punishing the citizen resident taxpayer who depends on the street for parking. And what will be the unintended consequences of this action? The adjoining streets of Holly Ridge, Lincroft, Rogerton, Belden, Westshire, and Rhonda. Here's what you need to do. Uh, you need to have, instead of putting a square peg in a round hole, you need to have a round peg in a round hole. Thank you. The Mr. illegal trailhead must Thank be closed you, Thank permanently. You. Stop the madness, please. Uh, George, George Abrahams. Uh, I'm opposed to the suggested uh, parking restrictions. Closure has shown that restricted parking on one side of Beecher Drive is not needed. With the reduced parking uh, the traffic that we have now, both sides remain safe. All that is needed is the permanent closure of the Holly Ridge Trail to entry and to make entry to Griffith Park via the main entrance at Western Canyon Road more attractive. Uh, there are five, uh, four things. I support Tom's shuttle to the Mount Hollywood Drive. We could have a new view spot above Bronson Caves accessible from Western Canyon Road. We should have no vehicles beyond the parking lots on Western Canyon Road and Greek Theater and have a Universal Studios tour style tram to move uh, park visitors north of there and we could have a shuttle from the Red Line Western Hollywood Station up to the suggested Bronson Caves uh, view site and all this will make Griffith Park visit a more enjoyable and complete experience. Hi. My name is Fran Reichenbach and I'm Beachwood Canyon Neighborhood Association. About a year ago we told uh, in, in the working group that the council office was generous enough to put together for us, we suggested a closure of the um, Holly Ridge Trailhead. And that didn't get a very good response. Um, but now that um, the trailhead, actually the trail, the access to the trail is closed because they're putting a gate in there. And these great solar powered signs are positioned at the bottom of Franklin and at the middle. Um, now that those things have been put into into play, we see that the, that the result is that indeed, if, that, if access to an entrance to that trailhead is denied pedestrians, um, we have no problem. Because right now, the streets are calm up there. I'm, we have a horse up there at Sunset Ranch, and twice a day I'm up there, and it's calm, and it's beautiful, and it's wonderful. I would suggest keeping all that in place and not allowing access, access or entry to, for pedestrians to that trailhead. Thank you. Thank you. Next four speakers is Simone Bent, Paula Escott, 
George Clark and J. Brent Rice. Uh, Mr. Chair, before the speakers, I want to show this well, committee something. One of the challenges here, and I hope everybody can hear me, one of the challenges here unique to Griffith Park, and I'm going to show this to the city attorney and clerk afterwards. This right here is the stables. This right here is Mount Lee. This is a private parcel. The stables, the stables are a private business that operate inside the city park. It predates everything. The original gift from Mr. Griffith was basically this border. This land was given by the development company or acquired by the city of Los Angeles or through Forest Lawn over the last 50 years. In that sense here, there's public access to this business here. They have an easement to go to. In addition, the uh, community asked for the trailhead years ago when the trailhead on Holly Ridge was closed. But they do have a serious challenge, and this is why we have to bring it over, but I wanted to make those points. Thank you, and to the speakers. Thank you. Uh, Simone? Yes. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm here really in solidarity with my neighbors. Um, I think that we almost unanimously believe that this proposal, while well-intentioned, is ill-advised. It, no, it in no way represents the residents who've been adversely affected by the reckless and dangerous excessive visitor car and visitor foot traffic. I, I'm, I'm kind of sitting here in disbelief because I, I find it a little unbelievable that after decades of public service, this issue seems to have you stumped. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. If you guys really don't know what to do, I'm here to volunteer to have a proposal that benefits the neighbors and the businesses and the tourists on your desk in 60 days. Thank you. I'm Paula Escott. I'm a resident at Beechwood Drive, right at the bend in the road where it gets really narrow. I'm not in favor of one side of the street parking or permanent parking. Those are Band-Aids. Griffith, Griffith Park is for all the people, for all the tourists, for everyone. Let's keep it safe. Enter the park at its entrance in Los Feliz Boulevard, Riverside Western. There is parking, bathrooms, picnic areas, hiking trails. People can bring their kids there to play. It is a park. Let the park rangers take care of it, like every other park in the state. There is nothing more disappointing, and I've been outside my house talking to people as they come back down from the traffic jam saying, is that all there is? That's all there is up there is a traffic jam. There is nothing for kids. There is nothing for elderly people, for all the tourists that go up there. If you could look at them, you know they don't want to get out of their car. They're not hiking. Good afternoon. My name is George Clark. I live at 6040 Rogerton Drive. It's a very simple uh, thing to look at. If you look at the side streets off of Beechwood Canyon, those are even narrower. Those are even more dangerous. If you move all the cars on the east side of Beechwood into those surrounding streets, you're going to create not just one problem with one avenue up Beechwood, but all those intermediate streets now will be impacted by all those move cars. So all you're doing is shifting the burden and creating actually more problems. It's, I don't understand how you can think like this. It's simple math. Mr. Rice. My name is Brent Rice. I live at 3100. Uh, in between two stop signs that are routinely uh, uh, ignored by visitors to our neighborhood. Uh, my concern is that by closing, I, I think the intentions were good in uh, coming up with this proposal, but I think it's misguided. I think that uh, opening one side of the street is going to make it a thoroughfare even faster. And as a father of a four-year-old who would have to cross the street every time, I'm gravely concerned about access to my cars and to other neighbors and pedestrians walking up and down the street. Um, I would like to see it posted as permitted. Uh, if you were to go up, I would encourage any council member to go up there right now. You'll see how many cars actually reside there, even factoring in vehicles that are doing work like construction and yard keeping and nannies. The street is really not that impacted. I think if you can permit it, both sides of the street, everybody will be happy. I think this is a step far too far 
at the beginning, if this is something that needs to be revisited in a couple years, if it's not working, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's allow us to park on both sides of the street. The next speakers are Jack Conrad, Tony Clark, Dr. William Embotter, and uh, Sarah Jane Schwartz. You stay over there. Hi, I'm Jack Conrad. I live at 2958 North Beachwood Drive. I've lived in the area since 1960. Excuse me, we'll, we'll hold your time for just a second. Could folks on the side, please, folks, uh, either uh, keep quiet or take your conversations outside. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, my name is still Jack Conrad, and I've still lived in Beachwood Drive since 1966. Um, this idea of redlining my side of the street is not a good idea. My wife is disabled. Uh, I'd have to walk her across the street to get to a car. That's no good. We currently have the trailhead closed to put in a new gate, and we don't have traffic problems up there right now. I think that speaks for itself. I don't think we need to go any further than that. Close the illegal trailhead, period. Mr. Clark, folks, could you please hold your applause so we can keep moving? There's a lot of folks here for a lot of items, uh, and it'll just save a little bit of time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Clark. I'm Tony Clark. I've lived at Beachwood for over 40 years, and this has turned into an absolute nightmare. To put one side with just uh, no parking is going to compound the problem of the parking of the people that live there now. All, everyone's going to be on one side, plus tourists or visitors, they can only park on one side. So you are compounding a problem. This whole thing, if you leave that gate open, which you need to close the trailhead, but if you leave it open, there's still going to be traffic and it's still going to be a problem. There's gridlock. We've talked about the videos that have gone on up there and it does happen Finally, there's this little band-aid of these, these things being repaired, and you can get them down. But if you do close it, yes, a, uh, a fire engine can go past there, but there's still going to be the gridlock of all those cars. We need permit parking. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor. Yes, uh, I've lived on uh, True 933 North Beachwood for 42, ye 42 years, and I'm retired now and have been for about 30 years and I can watch all this debacle going on all of the time. It has been exacerbated by uh, the idea that there's something at the end of the trail. Some of the tourists are stopping when I went down to get my mail and asked me, what kind of rides do they have up there? <laughs> and this is true. This is, they think this is some kind of uh, amusement park and it's promoted very much that way. Uh, I, putting uh, restrictions on one side of the street versus the other is discriminatory. That cannot be. Permit parking is the solution. Closing the trailhead is the solution. And others have said that. I concur. Ms. Schwartz. Uh, you've seen all of the people that have come today taken time out from their busy schedule. These are the people that couldn't come today. We were given notice of this meeting from the councilman's office Monday night, yet this is what I have in responses. There is one person who is in support of this, and even then I'm not sure that's really what they meant. These are all against. This has to be a first in that before we had thousands of people in our street by neglect by the city, now it's actually part of the plan to filter literally thousands of pedestrians walking in the street. I'm a taxpayer. What kind of liability is that, that this is now part of a traffic plan? According to city regulations, areas of heavy pedestrian traffic have to have sidewalks. There are none. You are eliminating parking from the parking lot. You are taking away half of the parking on the street. You are leaving open the magnet of the trailhead, and yet they're supposed to be parking. Also, if you eliminate parking from one side of the street, when people have to get to the other side, they will be turning around, Thank making you. u turns, and backing up in the middle of the street with all these pedestrians. Thank it you. will only make things more the dangerous. The final speaker is Mr. Eugene Gordon. I wanted to hand this to you. Thank you. 
I live at uh, 2753 Beachwood since 1999, and um, I don't know if you guys have been up there or not, but the streets are narrow and they're winding, and if, even if you do limit parking to one side of the street, you're still going to have a ton of people walking those streets. And all that's going to do is widen up the street, allow people to drive faster, coming around blind turns. You know, with gr there are literally groups of people, I mean five and six people coming up the street. There's no sidewalks up there. They walk in the street now and there's, uh, they're open on both sides. So all you're going to do is give people less places to park, more traffic coming up there, putting more people in the street. I think the thing to do, you know, in the order of, of things to try, you know, number one is closing the trailhead because I've seen a drastic reduction just by having those signs and that guy up at the end of the trailhead. It's a lot quieter up there. And then probably on top of that, I would be in favor of uh, permit parking as well because you just need to get people out of that area. We don't have the room for them and there's no infrastructure for them there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could ask Aram to come back, if it would, please, there. Just a couple of things. Members, the uh, challenge, and you may have this at other areas here, Somebody okay, officer? Okay. Just for the record, it's not an illegal trailhead. This was done as a replacement of a Holly Ridge Trail at the request of the Neighborhood Association. Uh, and this was done. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also I want to say this to all of you who live there. I'm proud of the city of Los Angeles and all the people in the city. And you have a challenge that it's so overwhelming. But I do believe in public health and public hiking, which is real important. And I also know that there's... Excuse me. I'm going to insist on order in this room. Anyone who's disruptive, I'm going to ask the sergeant at arms to remove them immediately. Everybody has had an opportunity to speak who has filled out a speaker's card. It is now Mr. Labonge's turn to speak. In doing so, most of the people who heard and testified live north of the village market. Correct? Most of them live north. Many people of this canyon do like to hike into the park. The gate is there to protect the non-operating hours of the park. And Mr. Scholl, the new general manager of the park, previously Mr. Muckry, were trying to find ways to solve this problem. It is not a, it is not a hammerhead. It is not a lollipop. It street ends right there. The two residents of the inn get all the impact, and then it continues all the way down. With the rejection by the community who would be affected by this, could you look at it again? Could you put preferential parking on both sides? And where there are choke points, this is where you have to give, neighborhood, where there are choke points that there be red curb and nobody park on both sides at limited space, whether it's for 50 feet or more near an intersection, so in the event of emergency, people could get through. And I might mind you, members, the adjoining streets of Beechwood Canyon have parking only on one side, okay, because of fire regulations. And they also have Red uh, Flag Day, which originated on the first day, a tragedy on Holly Ridge, uh, where multiple parking of residents had nothing to do with an event like we're talking about today. This is many, many years ago. Prevented fire companies from getting to the house. Uh, someone perished. We don't know how that it was impacted because of the fire or because of the long distance from where the trucks were to the house. What could you suggest, Aaron? Well, we need to consult with the, with the fire department, Councilman uh, Labange. The reason is it was a directive from the fire department to post one side of the street based on their observations. Obviously, we supported that along with LAPD from what we saw. Now, uh, we need to go out there again and see uh, uh, what sections of Beechwood needs to be red curbed, and my guess is the majority will be red curbed. Uh, uh, it's going to be the similar situation, same situation. Well, I wanted to ask you if you could look at it with very wide scope in the sense where if there is a choke point on the curb or something like this, yes, but if we could look at it together, and if we could hold this for 30 days, I don't want to, I don't want to see any implementation to have a look, and my staff, Mr. Holden, who's the field deputy, the chief deputy of uh, field, Mr. Miss James, will have a meeting with our staffs in the Hollywood Battalion, and then with a suggestion before we come back, have, we'll have a community meeting at the Hollywood City Hall in your neighborhood to try to come to consensus. To the people of Beechwood, it's a challenge. 
It's a public park, and that's not an illegal trail. If you want to address the trail, you could talk to the Department of Recreation and Parks and their commission, which has more authority than other commissions as far as regulating this, and also the uniqueness of Sunset Stables, which does that. I, and I, and in my many times that I've been there, there are many people who live in your neighborhood who like to get there, like to come up to the trail. And the other incident, too, that I want to say is any uh, idea as far as off-site parking, shuttle, or whatever should be explored as well. Yes. So people could do that. The other unique thing, south of the curves of this neighborhood, are you familiar with Beechwood Canyon? Yes, sir. The, uh, it's a, almost a very straight street, which has an invitation uh, that many people come. We're concerned about the hazards. We are working with the police department and the traffic divisions of the police department on illegal tour vans and others, because there have been very big coaches that have come up there so if I could have 30 days, could we do that? Well, we can do that. Just one more thing, uh, Councilman LeBlanc. The posting on one side of the street was not 24 hours a day. Okay. It, it ended at 6 p.m. and allowing the residents uh, after 6 p.m. to park all the way to 8 a.m. in the morning. Could you do it from 9 to 5? Let's just say we that. Can. We can. Right, here's the look question. At the hours. Absolutely. So let's do this, Mr. Chair, if I could. If we could look at that again and, yes. and fully educate that, maybe walk if there's a committee of the Neighborhood Association to walk it with us uh, and look at that, to look at other points if there was preferential parking on both sides. And believe me, I don't like preferential parking. The, everyone in the city owns uh, those streets, okay? Everybody in the city owns the streets. Everybody in the city owns the Department of Water and Power's uh, Lake Hollywood. And more people are getting outside. And you could smile all you want, Christine. I know We've had the longest relationship together when I was a deputy for John Ferraro. I want to try to find a problem-solving solution to this, but it does include my thought for everybody. Your public safety is very important, but I have to be fair to everybody. And my colleagues here have impacts, whether it's UCLA in the 5th District out there, whether it's the San Fernando Valley, which you represent, Paul, Mr. Parks, but he represented the area immediately around the Coliseum, or, or Mr. Bonin at the beaches. Or the, the airport, or the, the airport, Mountain. et cetera. So if we could do that, Mr. Chair, hold it for 30 days. Yes, uh, happy to hold it for 30 days, and you'll do a community meeting before it comes back. So, okay. Great. We'll right. do that. Thank, Thank you. you. And one other question I do want to ask. We want to get an impact from the fire department on expanded red flag day with the dryness, with the heat. Do we have more impact on red flag? Do we make red flag tow away? Etc. 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 For the safety of this canyon and, and all other canyons. Thank you. We'll do that. Thank you. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, please. Okay, I'm leaving. Please. Item number two, please. Item number two is the CAO report relative to a proposed funding agreement with Metro regarding the payment of $206 million by the city to assist with the construction of various projects. David Yale is here from Metro. If there's any questions in connection with this. Yeah, why doesn't have David come up as well? Good afternoon, gentlemen. If you could identify yourselves to the record. Good afternoon. I'm David Hirano with the Office of the CAO. And I'm David Yale, uh, Managing Executive Officer with Countywide Planning and Development at Metro. David, welcome to LA City Hall. Usually things are a little bit quieter than a Metro meeting, but today we decided to make you feel at home. Thank you for having me today. Okay, council members, um, before you is an agreement, a proposed agreement with between the City of Los Angeles and Metro, for the payment of $207 million of city measure our money to Metro, representing about approximately 3% of the budgets of the Crenshaw line, the original connector, and the West Side subway phase one. In addition, it represents payments for the Lemur Park and Westchester stations on the Crenshaw line. Um, the mayor has asked us, asked our office to facilitate negotiations with Metro, and the results are in this agreement before you. A couple things that you should note is that this is not the end of the negotiations for the 3% contributions for the regional projects. 
uh, Metro will be coming back and asking us to negotiate for the remainder of the regional projects, including most significantly the West Side Subway Phase Two and Three. Um, in addition, once this proposed agreement is executed, if you approve it, um, it will almost be irrelevant as to whether or not Measure R money is available. Uh, if we, as a city, do not use the appropriate discipline set and measure our money aside, we will still owe the money to Metro and we'll have to come up with it from another source of funds such as the general fund. Um, in establishing the, the agreement, Metro has also um, agreed to protect us from the upside of the projects, of the projects uh, budgets increase over time, which um, sometimes happens in construction. We will not have to increase our contribution in kind. Um, and Mr. Chair, were you look like you were having a question. Should I stop there? Or? No, keep going. Okay. Okay. In, in addition, um, it, it's important to note that the assumptions in this agreement, we did our best to try and make it so that the city, after we make these payments, will have a relatively stable share of Measure R money from year to year. But the assumptions in, in this agreement are greatly impacted by the revenue that will be generated from this, the countywide sales tax. We're currently using Metro's estimates on revenue, and um, we don't really have another alternative because we're not in the business of making sales tax estimates for the entire county. We only do it for the city. But if we do not achieve those uh, revenue estimates, then the budgeting exercise that we go through on a year-to-year -year basis will be even greater than we've projected. David, would you like to uh, sort of frame this for us and, and give us yeah, some perspective? Um, the, these agreements are fundamental to Metro's long-range transportation plan, um, in particular for the regional connector and West Side subway projects. Um, these agreements serve as part of the local match to the full funding grant agreements that we have sought from the federal government. Uh, we signed a full funding grant agreement for the regional connector in the amount of $670 million on the, ex the strength of a previous council action. And we are looking to sign next month a $1.25 billion agreement for the West Side Subway. Um, this uh, funding is part of the local match for that agreement as well. So uh, we are keenly interested in closing this out and making sure it doesn't become an issue in, the, in closing the deal for the subway. Okay. Thank so you. $207 million spread out over 15 years. Correct. Uh, that represents what percent of our measure our monies? Um, depend, well, on an annual basis, it's going to represent about 30 percent of your money on an annual basis. And on top of that, as you said, we will eventually have additional 3 percent obligations to Metro that will drive Correct. that percentage probably significantly higher. Correct. So um, I, I just want to underscore one thing you said, which is that the, the terms of this agreement specify that we, the city, are not on the hook for any uh, cost overruns or any change orders or anything like that. Correct. We're negotiating this as the figures that are there now. Correct. Okay. Um, and how, how are you anticipating that, that we're going to budget for our 3% contribution for those future Measure R projects, uh, like the Spalvita Pass, uh, Airport Metro Connector, San Fernando Valley Corridor, and the subway segments you mentioned? Well, first of all, we're going to have to know what the... the um, estimated budget as the metro develops, and then we're going to have to know what the schedule is. And I expect that we will work with our, our counterparts at Metro to um, make those payments over the life of the the, the project schedule. Um, I'm hopeful that that will extend beyond the time frame that we have now, and not double up too much on the time frame that we have now, because it will just increase the financial challenge that the city has on an annual basis if it does. And, and where did the sort of agreement and principle on this 3% come from before you negotiated the details? Was this part of how things were structured in Measure R, or was this sort of a subsequent agreement between Metro and the various cities? It was contemplated as Measure R was developed, yes, and, and approved. So uh, with the uh, – of the Measure R funds we, we have and the 10% that sort of comes off the top for bike and ped, these obligations, the obligations we know we're going to have – and the 
streetcar project that uh, that the city has obligated itself to. Are, are we going to have enough measure our money for all of that? Um, for well, for those specific items that you just listed, it's very likely that we will have enough money and measure our money um, over the 14 years to do that. The challenge is in the items that you did not list. The city of Los Angeles currently spends um, measure our money on other items such as median island maintenance and pavement preservation. And when you look at the sum total of all the items that we're currently spending measure our money on and you look at the projected revenue stream and then um, factor in this contribution as well, we're going to be in a, a structural deficit in Measure R for the next 10 to 12 years, very likely. So every year we will have to make some tough choices in the budget about which activities receive Measure R monies, which get cut back, which may maybe are funded by other sources of funds within the city. Do those tough choices begin in a couple of weeks, or do they begin in a year in a couple of weeks? I th think they begin in fiscal year 2014-15. So that's a couple weeks. Beyond that, all I can tell you is that the mayor has solved that problem. I can't tell you what they are until after his press conference. <laughs> yeah, some, often the mayor solves something and we agree it's a solution. Sometimes mayors have thought they've solved things and the council hasn't <laughs> quite agreed. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Exactly, yes. Um, uh, just a question for David. Uh, what are the uh, other cities in, in the county that uh, have also stepped up with the 3%? A commitment. Santa Monica. Uh, we have an agreement in draft form with the city of Inglewood on the Crenshaw line and uh, a contribution along the Gold Line foothill to Azusa project. And then uh, the Expo project is as the subject of a separate agreement between us and the city already. So those Culver other, city? Uh, the city of L.A. What about Culver City? Culver City, I think the station is technically not in their city boundaries, um, but I don't know the answer to that. I'll check into that for you. I'll have to get back to you. I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is within their boundaries, but let's check on that. Okay. Uh, if we've got to send them a bill, I'll pay for the stamp. I think they had it station deal that covered them, but I'll oh, find out. Okay, thank you. Colleagues? Mr. Kretz. So are we anticipating that uh, any of this 3% will wind up uh, coming from the general fund? We would not recommend that. In fact, I think you'll find our office will recommend every year that we try and budget that from Measure R, but um, that's obviously up to the will of the council and the mayor as to where you would like to pay it from. Uh, what I'm asking is, 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 can we anticipate that we need general fund money, or we anticipate that we can do it without general fund money? At, at this current moment, um, the best answer I could give you along that line would be if you were to look at one of the um, exhibits that we have in the Save Our Streets report, we show you that if you were to continue spending at the same level for the same types of activities that you have in Measure R, um, you would be in a structural deficit situation going forward. So, and that includes the money that's represented in this agreement. So every year you're going to have to make some choices. Um, it's just part of our normal budget process. And, you know, not, the, not, not an ideal position to be in because we're still trying to find ways to cut our structural deficits so we're not uh, dealing with this problem 10 years from now of always starting $100 million, $200 million in debt. Correct. At the same time, these are priorities for us, but I, I think we're not looking to find uh, multiple new general fund obligations if we can avoid it. Understood. We, we can um, work with you to accept Proposition A or Proposition C local return. Those funds are um, prohibited for use on underground work but to the extent we can find eligible uses or alternative funds that we could exchange, we could accept Prop A and C local return as well for, the, your, for this agreement. The one caveat I would add to that is that Prop C also has a structural deficit in it. So that's not, that's not going to be a very easy 
solution. Are we able to purchase Prop C funds from other cities? Uh, I'm sorry, purchase? Uh, what do you mean? Well, I know uh, in, in, in the past there were certain transportation funds that other cities weren't, weren't using their allocation of. Uh, I remember this years ago from West Hollywood days where we would, we would give them 60 cents on the dollar and they would give us their, their funds. Do we have the ability to do that with uh, Prop C yeah, funds? I remember what you're talking about, but I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to find out for you, sir. The Prop A has a trade restriction that does not exist in Prop C. And it's possible I have the two of them backwards. One is allowed to be traded and the other isn't. But certainly if we were in a position where we actually were looking at using general fund money, then it would be more cost effective to, to buy those funds from other cities if they were available. It depends on, on the price, as you put it. So yes, we can look into it. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Three percent is how many and what dollar figure you think? Um, for each of the projects, sir, it's in the, our attachment to the agreement. Um, don't want to call it off the top of my head. The, for the three yeah. lines, for, three. Go ahead. Go ahead. You got it. For regional connector, it's forty-one point nine million dollars. For Crenshaw, um, our contribution is thirty-four point seven million dollars. And for the West Side Subway, phase one would be $75.3 million. The Lemur Park Station is $40 million, and the Westchester Station is $15 million. And uh, what do we take in on parking meter money? Uh, we, I'm sorry, we're not including um, any of the special parking revenue funding. I know, but what do we take in at parking meter money? I think it was a little over $50 million a year in the, from the meters themselves. And all, all things together, including the park off-street lots? Because I'm just uh, saying, if we wanted to try to face something bit. head on, you, we would have to connect it to something that we do. And we use that revenue not just for parking anymore. We use it for general fund. General fund, correct. I mean, it's a tough bat, but if we wanted to look at that, I think we should see what that would do to help offset the cost and, and wean us off that. It Previously, all the money stayed in the Vermont Wilshire parking district where they got, or the Vermont Hollywood, or Alvarado 6th, or whatever it was. The next question, Mr. CAO, you belong to any national organizations or anybody in the CAO's office or any groups? I personally do not. I don't know about my colleagues. So but you learn, you look at the national scene, right? Yes, we do. What does the CTA, Chicago Transit Authority, get from the federal government? What does the New York uh, or the D.C. or the Miami or whomever else is a big city with transit? I just want to know how are we in relationship to everybody else as far as the contribution? I remember Mr. Ferraro telling me that we used to get 96 cents out of every federal dollar. That's a long time ago. But I want to know if there is a on par. I've been through some states and I see things happening there that I don't see. What does San Francisco get, you know, as far as the equity issue? We, we have not done that study, if, if that's something Has you would Metro like to Has Metro done the study? Well, I, I can tell you the $1.9 billion in federal discretionary funds that you are leveraging with this $207 million, it goes a long way to improving that equation. Got it. But I just want to know how we are in the whole field is the second largest city in the United States and uh, what could go. So if you, the CAO could go at some time in the future, let the committee know how we're getting along that way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Parks, Mr. Gregorian. Okay. Um, my personal recommendation is we move this forward to council. Is there, uh, it's approved. All right. Then we will move that forward unanimously. Thank you. And we'll have this uh, at Metro uh, later this month. Uh, yeah. If we, I think we put it on the May agenda. But if you act this month, we might be able to move it forward to April as well. Uh, how soon can we have this in council, Mr. White? With your approval today, the soonest we can go to council is. April 23rd. Next week is a uh, recess. Oh, so that's the day. So, yeah, we would go in May. Okay. All right. Thank oh, you. and we I'm sorry. I forgot we did. Mr. Christopher Sutton, public comment. My apologies for not calling you soon. My name is Christopher Sutton. I'm an attorney for the Weston Bonaventure Hotel. Uh, I'd like to get two minutes since we're not have a large uh, audience on this item. But, okay. Uh, 
We are in litigation. We went to your council offices at the last meeting when this was continued. We gave you copies of the tentative ruling in our favor. We gave you copies of the alternative diagram on the regional connector. And we sent to your transportation aides copies of the trial transcript where Judge Kronstadt was critical of the MTA's environmental analysis. This document commits the city for a long period of time to concentrate these revenues in a few areas when these are citywide revenues. The, the, the staff report says, the CAO's report says, approval of this proposed agreement will significantly limit the city's ability to fund other projects and activities for Measure Law local return funds. The next paragraph says, this means that if the city does not set aside sufficient funds from the Measure Our Local Return Fund to make payments, payments will need to be provided from another source, such as the General Fund, or Proposition C. So the question is, what is the city getting for the $42 million they're putting in the Regional Connector? Are they mitigating the impact on the Bonaventure and on the Convention Center when we are disqualified from taking convention business when the street is dug up in front of the hotel for seven years? The city's impact, the city-wide impact, of changing the downtown area from a, a, of a peaceful area to a construction zone is, is, is huge. MTA should, th these three projects, Crenshaw, Westside, and Regional Connector, you should have three separate agreements. There's no payments due on the Regional Connector for another two years. The Crenshaw payments are due in the next year. The Westside payments are due out in the future. During this schedule, at some point, you're going to be setting aside half of your money to go to this agreement, which you're making today for a long-term commitment. The Bonaventure would urge you to peel out at least the regional connector out of this agreement and have a separate agreement for it. Once you see what the federal court decides, once they go back and review the environmental documents and, and, and amend the project, because if they tunnel on Flower Street as opposed to taking up on Flower Street, they're going to save 50 to $100 million, and that this project, this money could go someplace else. So you, Thank you, Mr. you really need to think about what's going to happen on the regional connector separate from the rest of this funding, because this is a major impact on the Bonaventure's ability to, to, to serve conventions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll uh, continue to recommend we move this forward to council for the agreement. Uh, also, we'll note that uh, sometime uh, uh, shortly I'm going to schedule an item to examine what our uh, existing commitments are for Measure R so we can uh, better assess uh, uh, how we reduce a structural deficit. Approval of CA recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, have that when you come to council. Have some, some stuff about the nation, you know. Where are we getting our money, okay, David? You'll do it. You'll do it. You're CAO. Make it up if you have to, but you'll do it. <laughs> so we'll move that forward, Mr. Clark. Next item. Item number three is a DOT report relative to the status of the green taxi implementation program pursuant to a Kikorian Fuentes motion. Mr. Kikorian, this is your motion. Is there anything you'd like to say to kick us off? No, uh, it's just important that we um, hear back um, from staff about um, the results of this uh, step forward that we've taken to try to green our cab industry. And um, I'm hoping that uh, the report back will indicate that it's been as successful as we hoped it would be when we initiated it. So, um, Well, then I've got some really good news for you. Oh, good. Um, Janine Brands, LADOT staff. Uh, when we came up with the franchise renewal in 2010, it was approved with one of the conditions to have a new green taxi program. And that over five years, that 80% of the non-wheelchair fleet become green. That's 1,703 vehicles minimum, okay, out of 2,361 cabs today. Each year, there has to be more. There's benchmark. 16% of the, that amount in the first year, followed by 21% each year thereafter. After year three of the program, and we provided our report to the board for you, for 2013, our benchmark was 988 minimum as of December 31st, 2013, and we had 1,450 green cabs in service. By green cabs, we're looking at generally hybrids, but also CNG vehicles, and we're not just looking at greenhouse gas, we're looking at smog pollution reduction. So SULEV vehicles minimum with high mile per gallon, fuel efficiency so that you burn less fuel, burning less carbon, less greenhouse gas emissions. So with those green vehicles, uh, we are way above the curve. Our taxi industry, you know, had a lot of hemming and hawing in the first year, but they realized with the high price of fuel and the good efficiency from generally Toyota Priuses, which are the vehicle of choice, 
and Toyota Camry hybrids and Ford Escape hybrids and some CNG vehicles and a mix of several other vehicles that the program works. It saves a lot of money in the fuel expenses for the drivers. The lease rates are increased. Some of that goes back to the owner of the vehicle if they're not the driver so that they can pay for a more expensive vehicle than what would have typically been the Ford Crown Victoria. So as of April 1st, we have 1,564 green cabs in service. That is two-thirds of your entire fleet. And I think we're going to hit our minimum goal this summer, probably the beginning of this summer, a year and a half early. So the taxi cab industry took this project on. It's kind of taken a life of its own. Uh, gas prices are high. That didn't hurt. But uh, they're having good results for the kind of maintenance and the requirements for the different vehicles because they had it uh, backwards and forwards when it was Ford Crown Victorias, which were the vehicle of choice. So right now we have about 9% of our fleet as the old sedans still that are being changed out. We've got about 25% of our fleet as different minivans, including 10% total fleet-wide wheelchair-accessible minivans. And the other two-thirds of our fleet are green, and it's increasing each and every day. So they've met the minimum standards. We have, oh gosh, such a reduction in smog, uh, at least 68% in smog so far for the vehicle fleet overall compared to 2010, and a 41% reduction in total greenhouse gases from 2010 to now. So it's quite an accomplishment by our taxi cab industry. So. Uh, before we do questions, there's, there's a few public comment cards. So why don't you stay at the table? I'll call them up, and then we'll okay. ask some questions afterwards. Uh, Jano Bagdanian, Philip Batin, and uh, Jamal Hossein. Uh, one minute. Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Jano Bagdanian, um, General Manager of LA City Cab. Uh, as part of the Los Angeles Green Taxi Program, uh, LA City Cab has met the replacement schedule as was outlined by staff. And we plan to proceed uh, as well in the, by 2015 to convert all our cabs to uh, hybrid vehicles. LA City Cab, along with the other franchise operators, have been successful in achieving this smog reduction, pollution reduction uh, that staff has stated in the report. LA City Cab has invested close to $1.3 million up to date, and we have another million dollars to go to replace the rest of our vehicles uh, to make them all green and uh, for a total of about $2.3 million. Uh, under city's leadership to clean the air, reduce smog, Los Angeles tax industry has responded. Uh, and by converting all or most of our fleet uh, to that. So at this point, I like to state that uh, taxis are a backbone of the transportation system. They have to be staying healthy as a company. And we appreciate uh, to serve the city of Los Angeles Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Philip Etten, and I'm driving a LA City cab uh, with the Prius. I received so many compliments from the passenger. Everyone is about my Prius. They are so excited to see a taxi cab doing their part to save the environment. Most cities across the country don't have taxi fleet. They're as, good, as green as we are. I know that I'm uh, helping decrease smog and greenhouse gas here in Los Angeles. I also know that the illegal taxi cabs such as the Uber and Lyft have a big SUV and all polluting cars that make air quality worse. We work hard to meet the green holes that I am proud to be part of a green company. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamal Hassan. I'm driving the LA City Cab. I'm part of the movement of the, to make the green taxi fleet. I, I used to drive the gasoline, and now I'm driving the hybrid Prius. Not only do I save a lot of money, but I know that I'm contributing to better air quality. Because me and my fellow drivers going green, I know that I have helped reduce smoke by the almost 75% and greenhouse gases by almost 60%. I have seen some illegal taxes such as Uber, Leap, in SUV and old car. I know they are, they are part of air pollution problem. I am proud to be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask a technical question? Sure. When someone wants to go to the Hollywood sign, where do you go? <laughs> Up Beachwood Drive, right? 
Uh, next three speakers are Vartan Arkelian, Bill Rouse, uh, William Rouse, and uh, Jonathan Parfrey. My name is Vartan Arakelian. I'm associated with the Yellow Cab. I'm, an, I'm a shareholder in Yellow Cab for six years almost and 24 years cab driver. So I'm, an, I'm a part of the, this movement of the, you know, to make the taxi fleets greens and also I uh, used to drive for many years as a minivan, which is gas consumption high and the maintenance also high, which has uh, replaced the car in 16 months ago with a hybrid Prius and it's, it's very helpful for the services for the customers. They are very comfy, very comfortable without, because of the noise. However, and uh, because of this, I just also, my fellow drivers, also we are going for this green and I know that it's going to help to reduce the smog and uh, in the, with almost 475%. In the country where the Uber and left and other cars, they are, some of most of them maybe, they are less than two, two, 2008 and two, 2009. Thank you. And I'm proud of this uh, part of the solution. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Rouse. Good afternoon, Bill Rouse, Yellow Cab and United Checker Cab, uh, representing the more than 450 working families who own uh, our two fleets. I want to thank uh, the staff for their work on this, uh, Janine in particular, as well as uh, the council for, um, for your attention to this matter. Uh, the city has asked the industry to step up, and step up we did in a big way. Uh, so far across our industry, uh, there has been an investment of more than $20 million in, uh, in new equipment. Uh, almost all of which is clean fuel equipment, and even on the um, a lot of the minivan replacements, we are um, we have ultra low emission uh, cleaner minivans uh, that are going in as well. The vast majority of the vehicles, um, as is shown in the staff report, are some of the newest, cleanest vehicles on the road, Priuses and Prius Vs, which have made uh, excellent additions to our fleets. Um, these um, vehicles can. Am I already done with a minute? Yeah, you're a wow. fast driver. Okay. Um, just uh, if I can please point out that um, these investments have been made at a time of great uncertainty uh, in our industry, both in terms of the franchise length and in terms of competition uh, from unlicensed, uh, unregulated entities. So um, we're following your rules. Yeah. Please back the cab industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mr. Rask, uh, congratulations on your recent nuptials, right? Or was it engagement? Thank you, Councilman. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Jonathan. Uh, Mr. Chairman and esteemed council members, my name is Jonathan Parfrey. I'm the uh, executive director of LA's climate change organization called Climate Resolve. I'm also the vice chair of the organization CICLAVIA, which has been mentioned earlier. And I just want to commend the Green uh, Taxi Cab program. They've really put up some Hall of Fame numbers. There's been a 41% reduction and greenhouse gas emissions over the course of three to four years. Now, when I was a commissioner at DWP, we couldn't do that if we eliminated both of our coal-fired power plants. <laughs> so I'm just telling you that uh, this is an example of government working where we're doing the right thing for the environment, and it has multiple benefits for working people and for uh, transportation in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, final three speakers, Saeed Rahman. Juan Ramirez and um, Eugene, I can't read your handwriting for your last name. Small year. Small year. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Saeed Rahman, and I am driving for the LSCD cab. I'm proud to work for a company that's value our environments, Yellow Cab and all my fellow taxi cab drivers have been able to go green ahead of schedule. Over 80% of our taxi are hybrid vehicles, and we did before the city's deadline. We know we, do, we are doing our part for the better environments, as well we continue to serve all the communities around the Los Angeles. 
When I see an Uber or a Lyft car on the road, I know they do not meet the same green standard. With so many cars on the roads, it's important that everyone does their parts for our air quality. And I am proud to do my part. Thank you. Thanks for hearing my concern. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Juan Ramirez. I'm a driver of a Prius for Yellow Cap. And I get multiple um, compliments from my customers, um, whether they tell me it's, you know, cool car or good, you're doing a lot for the environment driving this Prius. And even some of the customers um, tend to get a little bit more interested in the Prius and their, the value of gas and how much uh, it saves the environment. So I'm proud to be, you know, driving with a cab company that's, you know, thinking about the environment, it's doing things about the environment, and i um, really proud of being part of this company. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eugene Smolier, Los Angeles Checker Cab. In 2010, when we all talk about uh, refranchising and we all were skeptical regarding greening program of the taxi, everybody were kind of scared. But here we're in 2014, and most of us have green cars. Los Angeles Checker Cab has 220 vehicles from 269, which is green already. A part of it is handicap vents, which is not green yet, but the cars are not available, and we're looking forward. But I'm here to say thanks to the Department of Transportation staff that works with us, and thank you to council members on behalf of LA Checker Cab and my other colleagues from United and Independent. They are not here, unfortunately. But Thank you for the support. Thank you for everything that we do together. We want to be part of the, we are part of the mass transport, transportation program in Los Angeles. And we're looking to work together in the long run, and we want to be part of it for a very, very long time. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just say to start off, con congratulations uh, to, to the taxi industry for their, for their great work on this. I remember when this was going through committee when Councilman Rosendahl was chair and there was uh, a lot of apprehension uh, about uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the clean fuel provisions and there was a lot of skepticism that they would ever be met. I think it's a credit to everybody involved that uh, we are uh, ahead of schedule and things are looking so good. Uh, it shows that the city of Los Angeles uh, and the people who live and work and do business in the city of Los Angeles are serious about a clean environment and it's particularly gratifying. I hope that this is the kind of thing we'll be able to say about the waste franchise system in Los Angeles a few years from now that we were able to, to migrate this quickly to, to clean fuel vehicles. Just a, a quick question for Janine. Yes. We were talking about how the, 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 the total fleet uh, is ahead of schedule uh, on, on its uh, uh, conversion. Uh, my understanding was that individual companies also had standards to meet? Yes, every company has in a schedule what they have to meet. Everyone has met every bit of their schedule and uh, one of them is, in fact, eight out of the nine taxicab franchises have already met this year's goal already and one hasn't met the goal yet, but they're right in line and a little bit ahead of schedule of where they should be to meet theirs. So uh, we're already at our point. And like I said, we're going to hit the total number. We're going to continue. Every company has their minimum requirement. So uh, we're going to have more than the 1703 when we're done. And we do need to keep minivans and other large occupancy vehicles so that we can share rides from the airport and have extra luggage so people aren't taking two vehicles on a, on a mission. So we need to maintain a certain amount of larger vehicles. And as those vehicles become available at an available price in CNG or some other hybrid type of allocation, then we're hoping for minivans and vans that are uh, going to be part of the green taxi program as well. So we're excited for that future to occur. You know, we want to go further with this. And we are going to go higher than this minimum number. But I'm just saying the total count, because everybody else is above the level already, except for one company who is on schedule and has met every schedule. Yeah. We're already going to be there sometime this summer, I guarantee you, with that minimum number, and we're going to exceed it. This is the kind of thing that Los Angeles needs to do a much better job crowing about because... Uh, yeah. Uh, and I'm counting on Jonathan to help us get the word out. Is he still here? <laughs> 
Well, I'm going to hold them accountable for that. Uh, there was w one thing I wanted to ask about. There was a lot of concern when, when this was put into place that the, the costs of using the, the cleaner fuel vehicles would be passed on to the customers. And uh, as I recall, there were some uh, uh, safeguards put in place about that. Can you describe how um, those were? Correct. For the average cost of fuel, it's basically the fuel savings that is paying for the additional price in the vehicle. The owners have to come up with the extra cost. A used uh, Ford Crown Victoria typically to the industry was about seven thousand dollars in minivan eight to ten thousand dollars they're buying some of the used Priuses and they get, they're buying new ones as well because they're going to have longer years of service but the used Prius is going from 15 to like seventeen thousand dollars so that's twice as much money but what happens uh, for the lease rate the the driver on average at fifty five thousand miles per year or sixty thousand miles per year that they're putting on the vehicles that's typical in Los Angeles instead of paying two hundred and forty three dollars for gas per week at sixteen miles per gallon they're paying ninety dollars for a hybrid mix when we put all of them together about forty five point eight miles per gallon when I put every hybrid on the average together so that saving is over hundred fifty dollars a week and most of the owners are putting at least half if not a little bit more than that extra in the lease so the driver's still pocketing some money forty to fifty dollars extra a week in their pocket and the rest is going to the owner to buy down that car and any extra maintenance it might be a little bit more expensive for maintenance because some of the mechanics aren't as good as changing the engine in a Ford Crown Victoria overnight as they were fuel sales are going to happen also they can do them in pieces rather than whole they're finding out but there are going to be some extra costs possibly we even did a substitution program that's on the books and so some of the companies can get some of these hybrids as green vehicles on the road so if they have some ex unexpected delays for outages and vehicles they can quickly put a replacement car in for a few months and then when that vehicle is repaired or replaced uh, so there will be less timeouts because they were worried that there might be some unintended delays with some of the maintenance that's going to show up later years with the hybrids we, we don't have that experience yet so we don't know what's going to happen your, your personal enthusiasm for this is evident and palpable is and it? I'm absolutely certain that that has made a big difference Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, first, I, I just want to echo your thanks uh, to Janine and the department. This has been um, you know, a tremendous achievement in a short amount of time to be ahead of schedule, uh, to be exceeding expectations. Um, was a huge effort by the department and by this industry and by the individual drivers. And um, I, I just couldn't be more proud of how it's come out because you're right. Mr. Chairman, um, when uh, Mr. Cardenas and I were um, moving this forward, there was, you know, some reason to question whether or not these outcomes would be achievable. I mean, we hoped it would, but we couldn't be sure. Um, well, the jury is in. Yeah. Uh, the jury is in, and uh, it, it's been an outstanding achievement. To think that our taxicab fleet uh, has reduced its smog emission by two-thirds uh, in that short of amount of time is a remarkable achievement. Um, and I think it sends a, a very good message about the city that the tourists who arrive at LAX, uh, the business people who come in to, to this city, uh, they see uh, right there uh, this city's commitment to uh, the environment, to reduction of greenhouse emissions, to air quality, to reducing our reliance on foreign oil. They see that this city is committed to that um, by, in, the, in the person of our taxi fleet. And uh, so I, I'm very, very proud. And I, I just need to say one other thing, and that is this issue of the economics of it. Um, the, the people who, who drive these cabs are Hard, exceptionally hard-working people who work very, very long hours uh, to put bread on the table for their family, to, to raise uh, their family. Um, and they, they, this is not an easy job by any means. Uh, my dad was a cab driver uh, for Yellow Cab after, World, after he got back from the service in World War II. And so when I see these drivers here come to talk about um, how proud they are to be a part of this, um, and how much it's, of a difference it's made for them, uh, it, it really means a lot. These savings that are realized in fuel costs and so on is money that's going back into our local economy. It's money that these drivers, these entrepreneurs, then have to spend in our local economy. So it, it has an economic net benefit as well. Uh, the investment in these cars uh, has a net 
economic stimulative effect on our regional economy as well. So instead of shipping more money out to Exxon headquarters, we're saving that money and spending it, you know, at the local uh, restaurants and the local stores. And, and so I just, uh, on every respect, air quality, environmental impact overall, reduction of fuel, help to the drivers, economic impact, this has been a, a resounding success. And, uh, and I'm very, very proud of what the city's been able to achieve. So congratulations. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to the uh, LA DOT staff and the industry. This meeting today is totally different than when this was coming through the committee. <laughs> <laughs> just appreciate it. Thank you. Can I take credit for that? No, I, <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, well, first I'll echo the, the comments of my colleagues. Uh, this has been amazing work, uh, uh, both on, on behalf of our staff and the taxi industry. and, and yeah, I couldn't be more thrilled at the result and amazed that we're as far ahead of schedule as we are. Um, but there is a, a negative piece to it too, which is uh, we're only looking at what the taxi industry has done and the taxi industry is not the only industry that provides taxi services in Los Angeles. Um, I'm personally not that happy about that for a, a multitude of reasons, but have we looked at um, the impact of Uber and Lyft and others and the fact that they are driving gas-guzzling SUVs and old cars and taking a percentage of that business and offsetting the good green things that have happened in the taxi industry. And adding to congestion in your streets. Exactly. Absolutely. We know that it's happening. We don't know the figures, the numbers. Uh, we, we see that taxi cab trip numbers are going down while some of the demand factors such as airport travel and taxi cab trips from the airport continue to rise. They were up 5% last quarter and taxi cab trips were down 10%. That could be a 15% variant, but we can't blame it all on Uber. We're not sure. But Flight there are Earth. those other vehicles out there. Some are Priuses, but uh, from our inspections, our investigators out in the field, there's not that many green vehicles. Air travel at LAX is also up too. Yeah, everything's up, but taxi cab trips in the last quarter definitely went down 10%. And that's just a limited time. You've got to pick up a little bit more on the trend. But it was going up with everything else until the middle of last year, and then it really has started to decline. And we're very worried about that. And, no. and I think that's going to come again no. and again to the council and committees uh, as we discuss the future of taxi cabs and no. other transportation services in the city of Los Angeles. And if we've been working to uh, make that point to the Public Utilities Commission particularly? We've done everything that we're allowed to do, and I think you guys have some motions out there to try to get some more um, verbiage and ability to have a say on their policies and that ruling that went in to place uh, very recently. So I know there's some motions from, from I think, you folks here. We have well. a couple different motions that will all be uh, heard together in a committee meeting that will be focused right. just on that issue. And yeah. council members, as a point of information, there is a PUC workshop here at the end of the month where these issues are going to be discussed. Uh, I know that some members, a uh, couple of staff members, I believe, uh, Paul Backstrom, your staff member, will be one of the attendees and one of the participants. And I believe Mr. Koretz's staff member, David Hirsch, will also be a participant, as well as Nat Gale from the mayor's office. I'll be there in an advisory role, but not a participant. But I think if we have uh, the ability to have, have given this at least a little bit of study to point out the gains made in the taxi industry by greening the industry and the offsetting losses by um, a non-green taxi uh, uh, Yeah, and we would style. love to know the count, the vehicles, the trips that they're providing so we have a better idea of how much more uh, congestion and fuel inefficiencies might be out there compared to taxis. We don't have that info, so that would be something that we would highly desire, the information that the city should have as people travel through Los Angeles, and we would hope that you would help us push for that and <laughs> kind the of information PUC at least. And has not to this time uh, collected that information? I don't think they've followed through on anything. It's The program's too new. I don't think they've really... And we're going to find more in the workshop to see what information they have and uh, where they're at with some of the promises that they made as far as the regulatory scheme that was first brought forward and, and where they're going to go with that in the future. And, and yeah. uh, So I think it's a little bit too new to tell, but we, we want to have that. You need to have that information. We want to have it, and you need it. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to comment that uh, Ms. Brands here is what we love about our city employees who do things especially, and you, you take chances, you bring people together, you're the Department of Transportation's finest like Pauline Chan and others who do unique things to try to solve problems, J. Kim, and I could mention a lot of people, but I wanted to give you a little credit today. And Thank you. When Mr. Kokori was talking about uh, landing at LAX in the clearer skies, I thought, now well, you can see the Hollywood sign better and, uh, <laughs> and all that away there. But also what's interesting, too, the impact is that you have with the Internet in this last 10 years on all things, whether you have Uber, whether you have the, the new... Uh, rooms in, in, in uh, housing, catering trucks. Catering trucks feed off the internet and, and telling people where they are. So all these things are interesting challenges. Here's the challenge for the CAO, and I don't mean to pour water on this, but also we just talked about the Crenshaw line and the West Side line, etc. There's less gas tax being paid for by this. Is the state doing anything about equalization, mileage or whatever when it comes to this issue here? Or could you look into that or recommend to us? Because I think everybody should pay equal taxes on the road. So if you would look at that, David. So Because we are losing taxes the more there are green cars there are. When a Vox not in the room, you get everything, David. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Thank you very much. much. You'll receive an, uh, file. Receiving file. Thank you. Thank what you. Uh, I'm going to skip to number six since James has to be here for the special anyway, and I see a number of uh, folks from LAPD in the room here that I'd like to get them back out on the beat. Item number six is LeBron Joffero, motion instructing LAFD, LADOT, LAPD, Planning Department, and CAO in consultation with neighborhood councils and neighborhood associations to report on the analysis of current traffic conditions at the northern end of Highland Avenue. It's a Westchester yep. office reunion. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, <laughs> council members. Uh, Jay Kim from uh, DOT. Tom Carranza with the LA DOT. Rolando Solano with West Traffic Division. Sergeant Chris Coons with LAPD in support of Captain Solano. And Greg Savelli is right behind the chief of DOT. Yeah, we understand that Highland is a very challenging uh, stretch of roadway with the confluence of commuter traffic, tourist traffic, event traffic, Hollywood Bowl traffic, uh, the commercial success of Hollywood Highland. I mean, you name it. Uh, there's a lot of challenges on that stretch. Um, I think uh, the low-hanging fruits of uh, types of improvements that you can pursue have been pursued. Uh, so I think it takes a little bit of stepping back and looking at how we may better manage the traffic. And that's, that's, that's part of the reason why you've asked LAPD, fire, uh, our enforcement officers, you know, to sort of look at how do we collectively manage that traffic that's really unyieldy at times. And so, yes, we, we could get together uh, have a discussion and perhaps come back with the scope of work and a budget to kind of look at it in a non-traditional way. Uh, for example, uh, one strategy might be that you do have some traffic that goes through that area where maybe they have an option, but if you can intercept them earlier before they even come to the area, that could be one strategy worthwhile you know, to pursue. However, we don't have those communication tools set up and again, uh, the study could look at those kinds of technology possibilities uh, or even on a day-to-day -day basis or uh, during special events, how do we better manage that traffic uh, working along with LAPD. Uh, even parking meter technology could be another tool that perhaps uh, as we transition into smart meter technology, again, you might be able to reduce some of that recirculating uh, traffic congestion that uh, occurs. So I think there are some options available to us, uh, but again, we may need to just step back a little bit and give us some, you know, good thought. I just LAPD want to say anything, uh, and I know the captain of police is here. And when this impacts traffic, it does impact response time. I know the fire department again, which is in the field, they do pre-deploy people from their stations, which are south of Sunset, into the Hollywood box, if that's what it's called. But uh, for West Traffic? Sure, what I can speak to is that through the years we've had open traffic complaints are continually, and from the enforcement side has not had much of an impact at all. For the last three years at least, there have not been any severe traffic collisions, so speed is not the problem in the area or those left turns. Pretty much have been minor traffic uh, collisions, but nothing of, of a serious of nature. No traffic deaths within the last three years. No A injuries within the last three years. So with that, again, we're looking at a congestion problem, which we are aware of. 
And Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask maybe Greg Savelli if he could sit up in one of those chairs. Uh, I think we, time has come that we have to ask the Department of Transportation. I did have a proposal years ago that was never completed, but have a 6-2 plan for some traffic officers where six hours of the day they're working on enforcement of meter zones, et cetera, two hours in intersections. Blocking the box is often the problem, especially on Highland as it moves up. And previously, in former times, many streets had cone adjustments uh, for getting additional lanes in there. So, Greg, if just a comment, yeah, and I know... Uh, yeah, what you're describing is what we called our TOGI program, which is our traffic officers at key intersections. Uh, we have reduced that uh, over staffing issues. However, given the unique situation that you're describing and engineering is describing, we can certainly revisit that, especially for that, that corridor. And if I could, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be working with Mr. O'Farrell and his staff, because the 13th is on both sides, as well as Mr. Coretz on the south side as well. We're also going to ask Caltrans and the CHP because of the Highland impact, that roadway that comes right on there, as well as all the Bureau of Engineering, because most of the work has been done with the exception of the double right lane at Franklin uh, and Highland. Uh, so, and then as we come with the public process, we'll work with the neighborhood councils and the chamber and the bid, and then maybe in 60 days try to come back to you. We'll also work with the Hollywood Bowl, which has an effect on that. Great. And not yeah. to say one other thing, I just want to tell you, there's a plaque on the wall up at the Hollywood Bowl for a guy named Brian Moore who lived in the air. He's in heaven. He was a great community activist, but he fought the stop of the Metro at the Hollywood Bowl. The Metro should have gone to the Bowl. Uh, there was fear for a lot of reasons, which is unjustified, but this is a true example because now everyone of the Board of Supervisors provide buses from Lakewood, from Long Beach, from Azusa, which uh, all over causes additional traffic problems at there. So we're also going to work with Metro on maybe a shuttle from the Red Line station that gets people in and out. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Captain, just want to acknowledge uh, that, that you're here today. Uh, horrible incident at West Traffic uh, the other night. Uh, the prayers of the entire council and the city were with you and, and your colleagues. Uh, and I'm glad that, that your colleague is recovering well. I understand he's been released from the hospital. Yes, he's been released. He's at home with his family and in good spirits. But unfortunately, we got word about a little more than an hour ago that the officer in Valley Traffic, Officer Chris Cortillo, was taken off life support. That's horrible news. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. 60 days. We'll come back. Thank you, officer. Five. Item four? Four? For four. Whatever James is here for. Brings us to item four on the regular agenda, which is a bond and Martinez motion instructing DOT report relative sure. to transit service technology enhancements implemented by the department. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for your perseverance. Thank you. Both in waiting to get here and for everything you've done to get done what you're going to report on. I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to say thanks on behalf of the department to your office and your staff for recognizing the Department of uh, Transit Bureau's uh, efforts to uh, improve uh, the customer experience, uh, convenience, information, as well as uh, sustainability um, and efficiency. We've, we work hard in the group to try to uh, uh, stay up with the current technologies and to uh, to, again, try to enhance customer satisfaction. We have very high customer satisfaction ratings, but we're always trying to look for the next thing we can put out there to, to improve that experience. So um, I don't know if you would like us to report back or you want me to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing. Um, I'm give, give, give us a, a, a quick overview, Tay. I'll have you report back with something more detailed, but give us a quick overview, and perhaps you could break it into uh, two categories. One, the, the technological enhancements to the customer experience, and two, the improvements in uh, sustainability. Sure. Well, in terms of um, the customer uh, uh, Convenience, um, we've implemented the tap cards, again, so rather than having to search for change or to buy potentially multiple passes to ride multiple systems, you have one card that can get you anywhere you need to go. It's the regional card. Um, we have a um, uh, 
uh, next bus information system that we're, we're, we've just implemented citywide that you can go online using your, your phone or tablet, computer, and you can find out for any route um, at any bus stop when the next DASH or Commuter Express bus is going to show up. Um, that's something that a lot of people have found to be very helpful. Um, when you're standing out at a bus stop and you know the sun's beating down or it's raining, it's, it's very helpful to know in advance when to, to leave the building and, and go out and wait for the, the bus. Um, we've, uh, what else have we done? We've, we've improved our transit website so that it's, it automatically conforms to whatever device you're using, whether it's a laptop computer or a smartphone or a tablet. Um, we're one of the first agencies in the country to do that. Um, in terms of clean technology, we, as you know, um, we're 100% clean fuel. We, a couple of years ago, we converted our last remaining diesel commuter express buses brand new CNG powered buses, so uh, all of our Dash and Commuter Express buses are clean fueled. Um, we have just uh, last month and a half we've been running a, a zero emission electric bus demonstration project um, using a BYD bus. Um, so we're testing and looking at uh, electric zero emission technology and we also recently put in a grant um, to the FTA for a fuel cell bus project, another zero emission technology. So. That's an example of uh, some of the, the green technology that we're pursuing. Um, that, that's a quick overview, but I mean, there, the, as your motion indicates, there's a, the number of projects that we've been doing, and um, I'll be glad to answer any questions or provide you with any additional information. A couple of quick questions. Uh, we now have uh, tap cards available to city employees? We work with the mayor's office um, to make those cards available. The, the thinking behind that was that um, in the past we would produce paper tickets that we would sell to various departments and they would provide them to their employees for trips within the downtown area. Um, we think that's a, that was a great idea. Uh, it, it provides an alternative to using city pool cars to drive around. Um, we tried to make that even better though. We, but with uh, the idea behind the tap, tap card would be that um, rather than providing tickets, we would not have to do that printing anymore. So we, we save uh, money as well as paper and provide people with a tap card that both for those employees that work in the downtown area, it, it encourages transit use, reduces the reliance on, on pool cars, um, and I think just introduce them to the tap card and the transit experience. And, and I think if we get people to, to try transit, maybe that haven't tried it before, and they find that it's easy and not very daunting, that they'll be more inclined to use transit in the future. Do we have any uh, way of tracking uh, how frequently city employees use the DASH system so we can measure whether or not it has With the top cards that we've, we're providing, we'll be able to track the number of trips that they, they write on the system. And yes, we can do that. But have we been able to track previous? We'll be able to tell if the tap cards caused an increase? Well, previously we, we weren't signing cards to employees, but we, we do track boardings, but we don't know necessarily who those boardings are. Right. And uh, the real-time bus information that, that, that you talked about, that's really important. People have come to expect it more and more in, in their, their transit experience. Um, is that information integrated with, um, you know, uh, uh, transportation apps so that, you know, if I do a, a, a Google Transit search about how long it'll take me to get somewhere, will it actually add in the, the, the dash route and, and the times? Yes, we're, we do that and we're on, we're on Google Maps as well. So if you want to find dash, you, all you need to do is go to Google Transit and you can find dash and Commuter Express as well. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it helps also that the, app, the application that we use to provide information to the public about where the buses are, we also, uh, our, our dispatchers that are, that are monitoring the services have that same information on a computer screen. So rather than before we would pay people to stand out on the street at select locations and, and provide supervision to the buses and making sure that they're spaced properly, now we can eliminate a lot of those staff by, by using technology so it's, it's more cost effective <clears throat> and efficient. Excuse me. Uh, w when you say more cost effective, uh, anything measurable? Uh, we can, we, uh, we've been able to reduce staffing costs, again, because we don't have to hire people to stand out on the street. Mm -hmm. and, and rather than getting a sample, of, you know, because you only have a certain number of people that are on the street, we can watch every bus 24 hours a day, every location. And it also provides for, for us to be able to measure on-time performance, whereas before we'd have to go out and do samples at a, at a street corner measuring how whether the bus is on time or not, now we can measure every trip on every bus all day long using technology rather than 
in people so we get better information at a lower cost. And on the clean fuel stuff, the, the uh, CNG powered Commuter Express and, and Dash, that, that's all great stuff. Uh, was very gratified to hear about the, the demonstration project you mentioned with the, the, BI, the BYD Pure Electric. Mm -hmm. um, the, the grant you've applied for uh, on that, any idea when we'll hear back on that? The grant uh, was for fuel cell. Mm -hmm. um, we were also looking at a uh, grant opportunity for electric bus as well. Um, we ex hopefully expect to hear on the uh, fuel cell application in a couple months. Excellent. Okay. Colleague? Uh, James, thank you for all that you do. Well, one thing that I haven't had success in yet, Mr. Chair, is the issue of a uh, bike. In a movie lot, there's the bikes and they ride around from stage 12 to stage 24. And I have a motion in. Could you check to see where it is? Because I thought the motor pool which is right down here in the upper garage, instead of having all fleet of cars, could have a fleet of 10 or 12 bikes. And then if you have a meeting over at uh, Piper Tech or some facility, you could use that. And the same would be true at DOT across the street mm -hmm. or at uh, Fig Plaza, or if you don't, know, probably right even further to the public works building. Are you looking into that, or who's in charge of that? Uh, I'll follow up and we'll, we'll get if back to you. If you could on that. And the other thing, too, is although not related, but I just to try, I'm still pushing with Mr. Weezar for a bike rental uh, opportunity at Alvera Street. With the connection of Metrolink and Metro, people will experience Los Angeles with the extension of the Expo line. Mm -hmm. Now it's connecting on many of the tourist and cultural locations for our district from Universal, North Hollywood, NoHo all the way through Hollywood, all the way through the East Hollywood, down through the Miracle Mile on a transfer, but also Expo in the uh, California uh, Science Center, African American Museum, and the Natural History Museum. So if that could be done as far as the bike rental, just to add to it, especially on weekends. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and lastly, too, uh, I'm going to bring back the issue of stops for our double-decker tourist bus because they need to know where to go to get on the hop-on, hop-off, which is very successful in other cities, and we want to make it successful here. But if you could, James, thank you. And thank you for those open-air trolleys that I want to go up. I didn't think I'd have to say it for a fourth time, Beachwood, so they could see the Hollywood side. <laughs> on public transit. On public transit, Mr. Chair. You didn't smile. James, except for <laughs> I always smile. Thank you. Uh, Except for uh, when I'm at Ciclavia, I don't usually think to have my, my I don't usually have my bike downtown, so it's never occurred to me. C can you bring a, your your bike onto or hook it onto the front or the back of a dash bus? On dash, we're doing a demonstration in the San Pedro area. Um, currently, all of our commuter express buses have triple bike racks, which mm -hmm. I think maybe one, if not the only operator in LA that has triple bike racks. The dash is a little bit different animal in that it is geared more along the lines of a, a typical bike trip. It's short right. trips. Um, and the time that it would take to load and unload a bike on a bus would, would impact all the passengers on the bus. And if you're going to go a mile, you're more likely to ride your bike than, than, than use the dash. But we are looking. Uh, we did do a demonstration in the St. Pedro area where we have a lot of hills. And if that is successful, then we can certainly look at expanding it to include the dash system as well. What I've seen in some coaches in my travels is take out a seat and they have hooks up. You bring your Portland, you bring the bike and you hook it like at a hanger, like at a cleaner's. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's an option to look at that back and you don't even have to put it in the bumper. And the one thing about cyclists, usually they're pretty quick. Yep. Yeah, just one short question. Uh, um, I'm not very uh, tech savvy, but uh, if you're looking to get information on the on an iPhone, on uh, when the next bus is at a particular location, what do you do? What's the what's the there's process? A, there's a website. You just um, you can make one of your favorites. You click on the website. Um, you identify which route and which stop. Uh, it'll it'll prompt you to to act in terms of which route and which stop. And we have a stop number for each stop location in the city, and it'll it'll show you next bus arriving in one minute, two minute, three minutes, and then the bus after that. And if you want, you can go to a map and actually physically see the bus moving on a map. Oh, so you could track it like a, like an airplane flight, where you can actually see the right exactly. The progress. It's, it uses GPS. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for all the work you've been doing, James. Thank you. Uh, I, I, we we don't thank city employees sufficiently or frequently enough, and I know that you've really been busting your tail on a lot of this stuff. So I I, I really appreciate it. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. You bet. Oh, sorry. Let me just ask you, this may not fit in this group, but I was just wondering when I read this, 
is that uh, in some of the stuff is dated, but there's some maybe some new uh, issues. Do we have anything that, in the sense of uh, educating the public about the new technology on parking meters, or is there new tech? I understood uh, on our HOV lanes and the uh, what they call demand parking downtown that would fit into these subjects of talking about technology that aids people, and and one that we periodically get calls about is the uh, is there any new technology as it relates to the ride sharing and things like that that are more vehicle related versus bus related i probably would have to get to uh, talk to the parking folks and and have to get back to you i just wondered as part of that educating the public on this well we, we bruce gilman is our, our pio for ladot and we all within the department coordinate with bruce and, and other stakeholders to try to get the information out every way possible so i know that we're we're doing that but i can't speak to the specific efforts i just thought when your response if some of those these issues could be added to it because again, it's not bus related, mm -hmm. but it certainly would aid those who are not on the bus as it relates to some of the transportation innovations. And the parking meter thing is kind of old, but yet I understand they're still doing some additional technology where they can capture the information on the meter tech by technology as opposed to going out and, and, and seeing if it's uh, broken and all those other right, good definitely. things. Okay, thank you. We'll thank you. Okay, that was the last item on the regular agenda. Mr. White is going to remind me that there are two uh, general comment cards which we will hear, then we will adjourn this meeting, and then we will do the uh, single item special meeting. Uh, so Dennis Hindman and Ray Jadali. Come on up. Hi, my name is Dennis Hyman. I'd like to suggest that the city look into uh, repairing or constructing sidewalks with precast pavers, not custom wood frame forms and poured cement. And the reason behind that is that the pavers are standardized sizes, and you can highly automate that uh, using, in the Netherlands, a standard procedure, they use uh, a front loader with vacuum and pick up a whole pallet size of uh, pavers on the sidewalk, and they also put the utilities under the sidewalk. So any repair you need to be made, you don't have to tear up the, the street, you just lift the pavers. And then you get another pallet and drop it in to replace it. The other item is uh, that I have is, Metro has actually done counts at the rail stations. From fiscal year 2012 to 2013, they found a 42% increase in bicycle boardings. Uh, there's actually a report, and these, I can give you copies of these. There's a report that they made in 2010 of bicycle counts, and the greatest increase, percentage-wise, is the North Hollywood subway station. It's several-fold increase from 2010 to 2013. I can hand these out to you so you guys can Thank you. check, compared to the LA County Bicycle Coalition counts coming up. I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. Sorry. 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 Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. My name is uh, Ray Jadali. I'm a passenger of Commuter Express 423. I've been using this mass transportation from Woodland Hills to downtown Los Angeles for the past 23 years. And I was here a few months ago, and I had a complaint regarding a scheduling timetable. Councilman LeBlanc suggested to have a meeting with LDOT, which unfortunately was unsuccessful and I did not get anywhere. I submitted 50, about 60 people that signed a petition regarding the complaint. To give you a little bit of history, the bus that we had originating from downtown Los Angeles or from 2000 Oaks, they eliminate our buses which goes directly from downtown to Woodland Hills. They eliminate that bus and they combine it with another bus that goes to Encino. So we have to get off on part of the Woodland Hills and get back on the freeway. That added 20 minutes to the driving time. But the main thing is that they added one more bus or our bus to Thousand Oaks. The bus that goes from downtown LA to Thousand Oaks has only seven passage. And I repeat that, seven passage. But I would like to know, for the DOT who makes that decision, that our bus is fully loaded with passenger. Their bus has only seven passenger. The city of LA 
pays for those buses. The city of LA pays for the employee of DOT, not the Ventura County, not the city of Thousand Oaks. And plus, economically, it does not make sense. Plus, in terms of the environment, you have a bus that goes from downtown LA to Thousand Oaks, with seven passenger, when everybody else that goes to Woodland Hills or West Hills, which I live, they do not have sufficient bus. Okay. And I would like to ask you on that note, I submit a request to Mr. White. White, part of the California Public Record Act, for the time that the city of folks has spent on the research and the study that they have done. Thank you. Thanks. All right, that concludes our regular meeting. So we will adjourn the regular meeting. Yes, sir. And we will convene the special meeting. Item number one on the special agenda is the Wezar Wesson motion instructing DOT in consultation with the council um, office for CD14 and LA Streetcar Inc. and with the assistance of the CAO and the CLA to prepare a 2014 transportation investment generating economic recovery planning grant, Tiger Grant, uh, for up to $3 million for the downtown LA Streetcar project. Um, thank you. Um, in and then there were two. Yes, Jim Lefton with the Department of Transportation. Uh, in response to the motion, um, we're working with CD14 and Los Angeles Streetcar Inc. and um, our contractor project manager to draft a uh, grant application for the Tiger grant process. Um, we're looking at a grant of around $3 million. That's the maximum we can apply for under Tiger. Um, we're looking at a local match of as much as uh, a million, which would, which would be about a third of the uh, total cost. The uh, FTA recommends that while the 20% minimum is the lowest level you can submit, uh, that 30 to 40% would be preferable because it's a very competitive process. The applications are due April 28th, and uh, so if we're going to submit something, we, we're, we, we're working now in order to try to meet that deadline. Anything like that? No, as I always say, my boss does a good job, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you can't go wrong with His that. His evaluation is due next week, so. Uh, uh, so, a uh, couple questions. The delivery of uh, the project, does it hinge on approval of this grant? No. Um, as you know, we've applied or requested approval for project development, which is the next phase uh, leading up to the FTA um, rating the project and considering us for funding. We've made the commitment to FTA that with the funding that we have left, that we can get through project development. Um, and those, that, those costs and those tasks would not be eligible under TIGER. You need to apply for something that that is new and, and using funds that are not already committed. So in answer to your question, no, we've already made that commitment um, for the existing ta under existing tasks and existing funding. So if we get it, it's bonus money, more that they can do with the project. project. Correct. Okay. Uh, now, the, the trick with it, though, is if we get it, we're on the hook for a match. Correct. And to make the application competitive, we probably need to be in the neighborhood of a million dollars for a match. Is that Correct. what you're saying? Correct. Okay. Uh, now, the motion said that um, there's sufficient funding available for the local match already allocated in the project funding. How does that work? Where, where is it? What is That's it? That's correct. Um, there's been about $10 million, as we talked about previously, um, from the CRA, and there's a million of Measure R that was approved um, for the streetcar project. And those funds have been used um, for a couple of years now to, to you know, develop the environmental work that's being done by Metro and develop the, the preliminary engineering to get it to a point where we can submit it to FTA. Um, there's also some, a small amount of federal funds that have been included. So we came up with about 11.3 million total dollars that have been dedicated for the streetcar project. We estimate that we spent about 4.6 million of that amount so far. We estimate that we're going to need about 5.6 million more to get through the project development phase with FTA. And that leaves about a million dollars out of that 11.3 million total that we started with that are not yet committed, that would be used as a match. Okay. Now, when I look at the committed funds in the budget, 
-hmm. There's one thing, well, there's a couple of things that give me a, lot of, a couple of cause for concern. Because one of the, the sort of, when, when I get into office and the first brief done this, the sort of baseline thing I got from, from folks was previous council made a commitment to this, but no additional city funds would get committed to it. And so there's two things I saw that sort of gave me an alarm. One is um, we're counting on uh, DOT or BOE not billing us for any staff costs. Um, that's one thing. Correct. Uh, because that's essentially the general fund eating something up. Uh, and um, uh, the other is the contingency of uh, only 1.4%. Maybe, maybe my experience on the Expo Construction Authority has been aberrational, but a contingency of 1.4% seems dramatically, dramatically low. DOT, LA DOT would agree with that. Um, we had discussions with Council District 14 last week and raised that concern that by um, removing money from the contingency to apply it toward the, the uh, Tiger Grant local match that we leave ourselves with a very small contingency to get through the project development with FTA on the Small Starts Grant. And we've, we've, we've recently started meetings with the FTA and they've already identified some issues that we're going to need to go back and revisit and that's going to cost money. So to the extent that they're going to, they do a lot of that, we run into potential concerns about the contingency, but I will add that in discussions with City 14, they mentioned that there's some new funding that they anticipate that will be allocated to the streetcar project. TFAR, T-F-A-R funds, stands for transfer floor area rights, and, and per City 14, they were talking about 750 to $800,000 potentially by May or June of this year subject to council approval, and then um, potentially uh, some additional funding later this year. Jessica filled out a card. She'll be up in a couple of minutes, but let me, let me just pursue this a little bit, because I, the 1.4%, the what, what worries me about that is if we get this, and then we're on the hook for the 1 million, and our contingency is only 80,000, if then there's cost overruns or change orders, in excess of 80,000, which I think is a reasonable expectation, then either some other city source is going to be on the hook mm -hmm. or we're not going to complete the project and that's going to screw our record with the feds. Well, again, the reason that we, we kind of condition this on the, this additional funding coming in, so I think it's really we need to hear from Jessica in, in terms of uh, are these real dollars and can we count on these dollars or are they speculative? Um, if they're speculative, then that, that increases the risk that you're, that you're raising. Jessica, you want to come on up? Uh, first related, to Jessica Weathington McLean on behalf of Council Member Jose Wizar. So in terms of the TFAR funds, these are discretionary funds that are part of the transfer of floor area rights when a project wants to do a project that's more dense than the zone would allow. They move floor area from part of the central business district and put it in another part of the central business district. And there is a fee and a community benefits portion of that. So if, for instance, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Council already approved a $250,000 thousand dollar allocation out of part of the TFAR. Uh, we're meeting next week or the week after to allocate three million dollars in all of the various council offices that are involved. It has to be within a two mile radius I believe of the receiver site where it's allocated. So we anticipate a, a reasonable chunk coming out of that. We have two more towers that are going up that have already allocated um, or recommended their allocation to be at $800,000. So that as these projects come through, we're going to be using TFAR as a way to advance the project. Um, as Mr. Bonin very astutely pointed out, council has directed that no more general fund go to the, the project, no more city general funds, N no more, that's actually a misstatement. We don't have any, never have had any general funds in this project. However, um, when that item came up last time, Mr. Kerkorian actually very graciously at Budget Committee 
sort of re-articulated that and did clarify that this is not, not in any way meant to say that the staff can't work on these projects, that there's no staff time involved in these projects. It's simply we're not coming to Budget Committee or Transportation Committee asking for funds that would otherwise be allocated to a different project to come to us. Um, so you, I, I thought I heard you say that you were concerned about staff time being spent on the project, which of course would be necessary in order for it to advance. And I don't believe that was the, the direction of council based on the previous discussions. Uh, well, on the, 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 the staff time thing, if, if, if there's an open question on whether or not BOE might bill for, for $500,000, because there's some projects they do and, and some they don't, and it depends on the, the scope of work and the complexity. If this is something that they would bill for and they're just not billing for it, then that's someone else is taking a hit for it, was my concern on that one. I'm not in a position to be able to answer that question. And the, 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 it was the contingency that was my main worry, it, my, my, my my understanding, and I haven't done a lot of construction projects and pieced things together, is generally contingency is in the neighborhood of like 10% or something like that. And so the 80,000 would be about 1.5% or something. Um, don't, don't we anticipate that there'll be a, a further hit on contingency that will then be on the hook for if we're using the money for the match? Well, it's a little bit, it's a little bit misleading. We are on paper using the money for the match but we know that we're going to be back filling that with this TFAR funding that's coming in various dribs and drabs throughout the, the year. So on paper it looks that way, but by the end of the year we should have made that whole and then some using these TFAR allocations. We just can't, right now the only TFAR allocation that has been approved is 250000 We've got a million or so coming um, down the pipeline, but the, we couldn't use that as a match because it, it, it's not it, yet approved. That, but that's not ironclad like we know we're going to get our share of uh, property tax payment uh, or sales tax payment from the, the county at, at a certain period in the year. That's something that's still conditional upon approval, right? Sure, and they have to pull a building permit. Um, but these are projects that are heavily invested and we have every reason to believe that they will indeed pull a building permit. They have gone through a heavy entitlement and an expensive design process. So they're projects that are, that are well on their way. They're approved by commission. I mean, the process is that they will be approved by commission. They go back to CRA. They come back to commission. They go to Plum, I think, and also to council. So these are projects that go you know, well through the entitlement pipeline. Is that all done prior to the 28th of April? No, that's why we couldn't use those funds or those prospective funds as a potential match because they are not yet in our pocket, so to say. The, the, the funds that are available to us are the LASI, the Los Angeles Streetcar Inc. CRA funds, which are also part of the contingency, which is why on paper it looks like we're wiping away our contingency, but in fact we'll be backfilling that with other additional funds that come in. This, I, I just worry about the sort of, I, I, know you, I know it's very hard to put together a project, and, and, and you're, you're busting your, your, your butt, and so is your boss on this. I, just, I get concerned about things that, if they don't come through, then we either look really bad with the feds, and that jeopardizes future projects, or we're on the hook for additional money. So I just, I've, I've got some heartburn on it. Mr. Krikorian? Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit more about the Tiger uh, application process and what limitations there are on use of Tiger Grant funds, um, how often they come up, how many opportunities do we have to, uh, you know, dip into this well, how this impacts our larger transportation um, priorities in terms of seeking Tiger Grants. I, I don't have any sense of kind of the context of the Tiger Grant application process, if you can set that up. Um, it depends on, on Congress and the authorization of funds, but uh, typically Tiger has been happening about every year. Um, we applied last year f um, for some transit projects. Um, this year um, we're proposing <clears throat> to, uh, or we're talking about the streetcar project. Um, there, it could be used for a variety of different purposes, construction or um, design, planning. Um, we're proposing to use for planning. We've talked with FTA, and, and for the purposes that we're talking about for this particular grant application, it is an eligible use. 
Um, it certainly would advance the project going forward. As I mentioned, there's a $3 million cap on planning projects. And the other key point is that um, you would, we would have to go out to a new competitive process. We could not use any of our existing contractors that are already in place. And we would have to use... Why? You cannot... FTA um, will not allow you to use existing contracts or, or funds that are already committed for new grants. Um, that's, until you get a, a letter of no prejudice, um, anything that's already in place um, is not eligible. So, so that we, we, we've talked with them and they made it clear that um, we would have to go through a new competitive process to hire a firm to do this work. We couldn't use um, the Metro contract, subcontractor HDR or project manager. And any of the funds that have already been committed that we've told FTA already, we need these funds to get through project development, those funds cannot be used as match on a new grant, which is why um, we were basically dipping into contingency funds that weren't already committed in order to provide uh, the local match for the Tiger grant. Real, real sim to simplify it, it basically is they viewed the pot of money that they, they allocate uh, as a standalone deliverable. So if they want you to go through the process A to Z. So in our application, we would identify exactly what work will be done with this TIGER grant and the, the, that deliverable needs to, to be met. Okay. And uh, just a small correction, uh, they allocated, th of the 600 million pot available, they ad allocated 35 million for planning, but there is no cap on uh, the planning application. But about the $3 million, as the term is used, is probably the sweet spot where you would get uh, funding. If you can ask for 10, but they're not going to give you one-third of the pot for planning. And we have, if we I may, FDA, to, said $3 million. Um, Jim's right. There, there has been a Tiger grant of roundabout every year. However, this is the first time since 2010 that they've included a planning portion. So this is the first time that streetcar's been in a position to really compete for this grant. The construction grants, the capital grants, you have to have a standalone independent project that is achieved by this grant. Um, we can't build only the rails on one street if you're not going to build the whole system. You can't build a maintenance facility without the rest of the system. So we've never really been in a good strategic uh, position to be able to apply and receive the grant. We have competed before to get our name out there and make sure they knew we were doing a project, but we actually feel that we're strongly competitive in the planning category. Okay, so uh, am I understanding that each time DOT, uh, US DOT announces a new round of Tiger Grant funding that the, el the eligibility requirements are not consistent from time to time? They may Different. one year be for capital one year for planning one year for something else it's always capital but okay. this year they carved out a little portion of it for planning okay. as they did in 2010 and haven't done since okay they've kept it very consistent from la uh, the last go around the planning portion is actually one of the minor changes that they made this time. okay so as to the planning part then um i got a little be befuddled by the the match part so we have a million dollars um, that was committed for environmental and planning, and ten million from former CRA funds. Right? Is that what that? Uh, that's what the motion indicates. That's so. what's been awarded to the project. Okay. So is that the eleven point four that you were talking about a moment ago? That's been. The eleven point four is basically the uh, ten million from the CRA and the million of Measure R with some federal funds, a small amount of federal funds. Okay. Now is. Is not all of that money already allocated to specific environmental and planning tasks? It was allocated for the project, um, but I wasn't committed for any particular task, just a general description of the type of tasks that the funding could be used for. The key point, I think, is on the money that we've already spent a certain amount of the money, and then most of the rest, up to one, with one million excluded, we've committed to FTA that we're going to do certain tasks for them to, it's called project development, and that's the process to get rated and funding. Um, by squeezing out the contingency for that, we have enough money for the local match um, for the Tiger Grant, but the concern would be as long as we get those TFAR funds in to backfill, we would have enough contingency. So it's, it's almost like you look at it in three sections. There's the overall pot. There's the pot we've already spent. 
there's the pot that we've allocated and told the FTA we're going to spend, and then there's what's left. And what's left is about a million, one million and thirty thousand dollars. So that one million and thirty can be used as a match against this three million if we were fortunate enough to even get the grant. It's a highly competitive grant. Um, we think we're we're competitive, but we may or may not. FTA may or may not agree. So that million is n that extra, if you will, million. The last million of the of the eleven point four million is not currently budgeted for specific environmental and planning tasks at this point. It it's the five point six million that I mentioned earlier of the remaining funds have been committed in the sense that we need that funding to do all the tasks that we committed to FTA that we'll do to get through project development. We had a contingency built into that to help us ensure that if there's any additional work that's done, we'll be able to do it. We're basically essentially taking that contingency and using it as a local match on a whole new grant, which means that if FTA doesn't have any other changes and everything looks good, we're fine. But if they come back and say, we need more work here, we need more work here, we're not fine. So unless well, more What happens in that case then? Then you either have to count on this TFAR backfill or some other source of funds Correct. from something, some Correct. other city source. We base, there is no more money left in the streetcar pot. Right. So that's by the time we would have to execute an agreement to accept these funds, we would have a really good understanding of where we are with TFAR. They're not even going to announce these grants until the fall. So we wouldn't have to execute this grant until quite a bit after that. Is, is there any positive or negative relationship between uh, seeking Tiger Grant funding and uh, the eligibility for FTA Small Starts funding? No, the only thing they told us was that when they evaluate you for Small Starts, they're going to look at all federal contributions. So if we were to get an award for Tiger, um, it would be counted toward the FTA contribution for the Small Starts. So from that perspective, I mean, they, they evaluate all federal funds. There are projects that have received federal funding from different programs. It wouldn't be unusual. It's not unusual that you get funds from different grant sources. And, and so taking a step back, and I, I, I don't think I was clear enough on my first question, but um, when there's an announcement of Tiger Grant eligibility, what is our Department of Transportation's process for evaluating projects that may be eligible for that grant funding throughout the city and determining how we prioritize which we should apply for, uh, if any. Is there a limitation on the amount which we can apply for? I mean, if there's X dollars of funding, can we apply for 3X in the hopes of getting X? I mean, how, how, does, that, how does that work? Typically in the past, um, the mayor's office has coordinated with not only other city departments, but other agencies in their area um, to do just what you're talking about, to, to see what projects are being proposed and, and try to reach a consensus on which ones as a region we're going to go after. Um, this year, um, we've had discussions with the mayor's office and, and other than the streetcar project, I think there's a bike share project that Metro is considering going after and there may be one other project in the Hollywood area, but I, I believe that is this, the, the sum of the total amount of projects that are being considered for this year. So that process is typically going, that process typically takes place through the mayor's office. The bike share is a capital grant, is it not? Yes. Rules on their tiger this time are three for capital and three for planning per jurisdiction. So the city can apply up to six grants, three in the capital category, three in the capital. Per There's a bit of self-selection that happens because in order to apply for the capital side, not for the little planning grants, but the capital side, you have to have what's called a BCA, which is a benefit cost analysis. It's a very detailed programmatic report that you have to conduct about your project even in order to compete. Okay. And most of our projects don't really have that. We did one on streetcar a few years ago because we thought we might want to compete at some point for the capital grant under Tiger. But a lot of our projects don't have them. The port was successful getting a Tiger capital grant. Maria probably knows better, but that is a that is a high threshold for these projects to have to um, get over in order to even compete for funding. I'm 
I'm still kind of confused by this, but I'm happy to <laughs> the, yield to the chair. I, I want to sort of tease out something that Mr. Krikorian was asking about. Before we applied for this grant, we didn't have 1,030,000 extra. We had, that was allocated for, largely for contingency prior to applying for this grant. Yeah. So we moved it out of contingency and we're saying that we'll backfill it through this, these development things. If we apply for this, wh when will we know if we get this? I think in the fall. When will we know if those development monies are available and secured for this project? Um, well, we were supposed to meet on Tuesday to allocate uh, a significant portion of the TFAR that's available at the moment. Um, so I would imagine certainly before summer. And then there are the projects that are in the pipeline. You know, it's, it's how long does it take to get through the development pipeline. Sometimes it takes six months, sometimes it takes a year. But those are projects that are on the way. But we anticipate, um, you know, around 800 to a million uh, by the summer through this process. Because, I mean, I, I can't see how we can approve executing this grant agreement unless the contingency is fully funded. Because sure. I, I, I think it's, we, we know it's not going to be 80,000. What would happen, I, I'm very concerned about our relationship with, with grants with the feds, because if we do something wrong, then they tend to say, you guys in L.A. are messed up, sorry, we're not seriously considering you in this cycle. And we're finally starting to get some money, the L.A. region, from the feds. Uh, and we're at a point where we're going to need more of it. If we were, I mean, a lot of this is if, 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 but if we apply and if we get this, and if that money is not available, and we decide we don't want the grant and don't execute it, what then happens? Is it everything good, everybody's happy, or are the feds upset with us, and does that sort of jaundice our relationship? If all three of those ifs that you just mentioned happen where they make an award and we were to decline after the award was made public, it would not look good. They, they don't want to be embarrassed by awarding a project and having the city turn it back. But I, I will say that in our discussions with FTA um, and what we've read about on the, in the application package, they're going to make sure that the local match is available and uncommitted. Um, so that they'll, they'll be scrutinizing the application very carefully with regard to the availability of the funding. And again, um, that funding would be coming f from the, the CRA pot of money. So we, we need to make sure that the funding from the CRA, that it's going to be an eligible use and that they would agree to use those funds. Are they going to look at what we have allocated on paper for contingency? The problem is that the contingency has to do with the small starts process where um, what we're providing to them as documentation with regard to the Tiger is a separate set of funds. So unless they really look at both projects together and see how the funding is being laid out, I don't know that they would be aware of the fact that the project development contingency is being used uh, to, for the Tiger process. Because that's an internal contingency. It's not a contingency that we've committed to them. Right. That's our yeah, but, but see, see it, it's sort of there's a point at which it's 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 potentially an immovable object and an irresistible force, because if 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 we get the grant and we have to put the match and then the money's not in contingency, I'm convinced we're going to need more than eighty thousand for contingency, and in September, budget committee then T committee then council approved a policy that instructed CAO, LADOT, BOE, and all relevant city staff that no additional city funds, city funds, not general funds, including Measure R funds, should be extended for the streetcar project beyond those already committed to the project. And th th then what happens? Does, do we have to reverse that policy, or does the project fall apart and then we're in, in, in deep with the feds? That's kind of where I'm... 
and we've made the commitment to FJ that we'll, we can get through project development if um, for whatever reason, you know, we don't have enough money to complete that process, we, we would go back on our commitment. Because we said we, we said we can do it. We so have we either go back on our commitment to ourselves or to the feds is what you're saying? I will, well, I'll let you make that comment. But. I think <laughs> either of those are highly unlikely. Um, you know, and speaking as a project advocate, it's tough. We can't have it both ways. We can't say we can't put any additional city money in the project, but we can't use the internal non-allocated contingency to go out and try to find more money for the project. So it's, our hands are a bit tied. We're, we're seeking money to try to do what council has instructed us to do, which is advance this project without any additional city funds. But if we're not able to use the available funds that we have in order to do the match, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a circular logic and we're never going to get out of the circle. We have to be willing to say to ourselves, this is a project that is worth moving forward. It's something council has over and over again supported. It's something the department supports. And it's something that, you know, as a longtime staffer to my boss, he's not going to let a million dollars stand in between him and getting this project done. If it comes down to it, we'll find a way. When there's a will, there's a way. But I would, I would strongly recommend and please ask you not to strap our hands. We can't both not have city funds and also not be allowed to seek the federal ones. We, we have to be able to do one or the other. Uh, and we're, we're trying to be as creative as possible. We're, we're finding money wherever we can. And, and I have a very good... I, I have a very good reason to believe that we will be just fine, but it's clearly your decision. You, you, you get the concern, though. Certainly. It, it is, is that by doing this, we're essentially putting ourselves on the hook for additional city funds, even though our policy is not to do that, that we'll have to reverse the policy and come up with the money. I would suggest that we should probably have to cross that bridge when we come to it. If we're fortunate enough to be granted this grant in a highly competitive field, I'm sure we will find a way to make this work. Um, right now, we're asking for the opportunity to let the FTA tell us yes or no. Yeah, it just feels like we're then going to be stuck with the bill. And crossing that bridge when we get to it is just waiting to open the envelope with the, with the bill on it. Um, and the thing that gets me is that the delivery of the project doesn't depend on the grant. So let, let, me ask, let me ask one question about this, and then maybe there's a, there's a, there's a way to thread this needle. One is uh, I'm hearing that the feds are requesting that our ridership estimates be revised. How does that, what, does that have some sort of ripple effect on, on how this is budgeted and how the various pieces of what's available uh, come together. It's something that we need to uh, explore. It's not something that we can answer today in terms of giving you a dollar amount. Um, the, the point I made earlier was that we just started the process of working with FTA uh, to review the, all the information that we provided, all the money that we spent, to, and produce all this information that we provided to the FTA. They're going to go through every bit of that information very carefully, whether it's the project schedule, the cost estimate, um, the ridership estimates, and we've, they've already mentioned in the first meeting that they, they had concerns about the ridership estimate, and um, that's, that could be it, or could be the tip of the iceberg. We, we, don't, we don't know. It's, I mean, it, it, it's, we're going to have to go through the process and find out where FTA has issues and concerns, and to the extent that they say, go back and do this again, go back and do this again, and to the extent that if we need to change a certain aspect, it's possible that it could have ripple effects on other elements that are dependent upon, in this case, the ridership estimate, but it's really too early to predict just how significant that's going to be. This is due the 28th. If we were to hear in committee on the 23rd with the placeholder on the 25th, what further uh, 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 can, can be done to secure that development money by the 23rd so that, that we have a greater assurance that the uh, contingency is actually being backfilled? I'm not sure that, that 
uh, the, the committee that allocates the TFAR is actually managed by the CLA's office. We were supposed to have met on Tuesday, and they canceled that meeting this, this morning. So I don't know that I can guarantee you that we're going to meet. I don't know when we're going to meet. We were supposed to meet on Tuesday. It might be Wednesday. It might be two weeks from now. It's a little bit out of our hands. I've, we've actually been pushing them to go as quickly as possible for, for a long time now. I don't know that that's going to be done in three weeks, or two, well, two weeks and two days, actually. It, it, it takes the CLA doing a meeting? It does. It's a, it's a committee meeting. Um, it's an advisory committee meeting that consists of the council offices that are within two miles of where the, t the transfer floor area rights was allocated. So this particular committee in is inclusive of CD14, CD9. Uh, the committee is inclusive of CD14, CD9, the CLA's office, the CAO, and planning in the mayor's office and the downtown neighborhood council. Those are the members. The affected council districts are CD1, CD13, CD9, and CD14. Um, so I'm not, I, I, won't, I would never presume to be able to make a promise for you on the scheduling available on the CLA's office in terms of the scheduling of that committee or on how quickly that advisory recommendation would move through council committees. I, I can't control that, that uh, particular. Oh, it's not just that committee. At the next That's program, correct. It's an advisory and then that would go to council. And this is the first time it's ever happened, so we're actually not even clear where it would go. Does it go to budget? Does it go to economic development? No, but we don't, we honestly don't know. It's the first time we've ever had this particular situation in the city, so. The process is uncertain. The, the TFAR process? It is. So well, it's regulated by ordinance, but actually exercising the process, this is the first time we've done it. So what, where, where would that, money otherwise be used what what are the what's the range of options i i thought the tfar money was under cd14's control it is part of it is some of it is the 250 for instance that went through already some of it sometimes when you have a project that transfers or they just write a check to the city to a to a trust fund and then this committee that i'm talking about allocates out of the trust fund to the available projects and and resources within the the project area so it couldn't go anywhere else it must be allocated to the projects that are eligible for TFAR resources, but it's just the process of allocating it through that trust fund has never happened before. And it's been, you know, it's been a several month long process. We had to develop a process. So I couldn't predict for you that that's going to be finished by the end here, of the month. Here's what scares me. On one hand, I'm hearing the money's going to be there. It's just a matter of time. And then on the other hand, I'm hearing we've never done this process before, which makes me feel like maybe it won't be there. Well, it's clear. It's, it, ultimately, it will be council's decision. The advisory body will make a recommendation. Um, the process itself has never been enacted before to take the money from the trust fund and allocate it to various projects within the um, project area. Mr. Clerk, with only two members here, what are our options? Well, it's not unsimilar, dissimilar from going to council as a report. You could send your action today as a communication to council. The primary difference being when it's in council, that will open it to public comment. There's other nuances, but that's the primary difference. Uh, you could continue it to your next meeting with a placeholder for the 25th, or in the interim, uh, if you don't want to hear on the 25th, you could waive it. If additional information comes forward to you and you're satisfied with that, you could waive the motion to council uh, to be heard after the, the recess. Well, my original inclination would be to continue to the uh, to the 23rd with council on the 25th, but I'm not hearing that that'll give us any additional uh, guarantee or security. Um, uh, I certainly wouldn't deny Mr. Weezer the opportunity to have the item heard, but... Um, well, it, it, it may not provide additional security, but it might. Right. I mean, we don't know. We, I, mean, they I don't want to make promises. Next week. So if you do that and it comes back here... You might have inf more information, right. or if not, we're in, we'd be in the same position as we are. Right, because otherwise I'd, I'd be inclined to send it forward without a recommendation. Oh, Mr. Chair, we can always, I mean, David, from the CEO, we have not been involved in the TFAR thing. We can do some work with our offices and make a report back as well at the next meeting if you want to hold that. We haven't heard this, in, you know, except for yesterday, so we can get some more information and report back. And it would be my request to the CLA that they find an opportunity to schedule the meeting in a timely manner so that we can get some clarity before the 23rd. 
I'd be comfortable with either option, Mr. Chairman, whatever your, your preference is. Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do the, the 23rd, 25th option, and <coughs> we may wind up with the other option in the end. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you.